Sure will. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity to come and present to you all some information regarding uh, the Stock Fulton County Transit Initiative. My name is Morgan Simmons. I am the. I, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, ma'am. So sorry. <laughs> My grandmother did not approve me not to be able to speak up. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Hello? There you are. Yeah, that's better. Okay, I'm just going to speak in. Okay. Well, good afternoon. Well, e good evening again. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Morgan Simmons. I am the project manager with MARTA. And today, myself and Casey Merch from WSB, we're going to present some information to you all regarding the South Fulton County Transit Initiative. And that is a focus of looking at BRT feasibility on South Fulton Parkway, as well as looking at transit enhancements along Roosevelt Highway, where we're currently, where we currently have a MARTA service Route 180 that serves and traverses the area. We do have a presentation, I believe you all have it. Mm -hmm. yeah, what So just a few people that's on our project management team, myself, myself, as well as my interim uh, GM with planning, Shelly Kirk, Casey Mertz is with WSP, Grady Smith, which a lot of people are familiar with Grady Smith, he's with BHP and a part of this project, as well as we have the collaborative firm with Michael Hightower and Kathy Warren. Um, they're also part of this project and they're a big part of the engagement, the coordination that's necessary for the project. And at any point, if y'all can't hear me, let me know, please. All right, project focus. Next slide. So just to kind of remind us of how we got here, there's been a lot of plans, a lot of studies been done regarding the South Fulton Parkway corridor as well as the Roosevelt Highway corridor over the last couple of years, dating all the way prior to 2018, with the county comprehensive plan looking at these corridors as, a, as important arterials within the South Fulton, Southern Fulton County area, um, looking at the access management study that GDOT did, and, um, and even just looking at some smaller studies, the LCI that Fairburn did. Um, just kind of really identifying the importance of us making sure that these corridors are, you know, a priority. Of course, with 2018, um, Fulton County had the transit master plan that was adopted that identified both Roosevelt Highway as well as um, South, Fulton, South Fulton Parkway as arterials of interest and so and of need of high capacity transit whether it be AOT whether it be BRT and so forth the Southern Fulton comprehensive transportation plan identified those quarters as smart livable economic arterials that are very important to the Southern Fulton County area and of course last but not least the 15 amendment that was passed that identified that South Fulton Parkway be investigated and identified and assessed for transportation opportunities and transit needs as a result of so much stakeholder involvement, that's how Roosevelt Highway got added because the stakeholders really saw an interest in making sure that Roosevelt Highway was also given that same opportunity to have some enhancements as well. And so we're here. <laughs> Next slide. So just a reminder of the project study area that we're looking at. Um, we're just looking at South Fulton Parkway, that BRT feasibility traversing from all the way from Hamilton Fairbrook Road, going into the College Park Station area, and then with Roosevelt Highway, that's traversing all the way into Palmetto. Um, so we'll, and we'll talk a little bit about with this particular presentation, what are some of the things that we're looking at, the schedule, and so forth. Next slide. And of course, just a reminder that as we're going through this process, we're always trying to make sure that we're understanding the different modes that are at our disposal. I'm so grateful for where we are in transportation because we do have such a, a, a facet of um, opportunities from a transportation standpoint. Um, when we, and so we put this here just to kind of show you that cross comparison of the different modes from local to ART to BRT. Not only just looking at it from a station spacing standpoint, uh, a span of service standpoint or capacity, but also keeping in mind the planning and construction time. You know, if we're wanting to put something on the street pretty quickly, there are certain things that's going to go a little bit quicker than others. So, just always making sure that we're having a full picture as we're looking at the different modes. Next slide. Okay. All right, thank you. So with Roosevelt Highway, like I mentioned, we're looking specifically at transit enhancements. 
So those trans enhancements are gonna either include the, uh, the improved stop, which is gonna be kind of your standard, your shelter, your landing pad, that technology that's there, um, or it's gonna be a super stop, depending on the ridership and the demand that exists there. Um, that's gonna be the larger canopy structure. It's gonna be um, more of a shelter-like amenities that are associated with it. Um, so we're looking at that and assessing that and kind of going through that as we're going through this process. Yes, ma'am. What would determine a super stop? Um, so for super stop, it a lot of ridership demand. If there's existing a lot of demand there, if there's an opportunity for us to capitalize on real estate that's uh, that's available. Um, if we recognize that there's a, a a certain level of land development that's taking place, if it's not currently there, if it's coming. Mm -hmm. So we're keeping all of those things in mind. And so as we're going through this process, the first part of it is looking at existing conditions okay. and looking at what, what are we working and that'll help us to move forward. Okay, thank you. Very good question. Next slide. And so for VRT features, um, just kind of providing you all some visuals of what those may look like. And so with the VRT quarter, your VRT features are gonna be larger canopy, lots of technology, markers, um, the, trans, the TSP, which is that utilization that's specific to the VRT system, you know, the cable lanes, and so forth. Next slide. So we're gonna kind of talk a little bit about the process, the schedule, and the outreach that we're gonna be doing with this process. So as you can see, we have the two processes that are pretty much going to go parallel with each other. Um, both South Fulton Parkway as well as Riverwood Highway, they're gonna have their assessment phase, which is going to end at the end of fiscal year 2023. Um, we'll go into the concept design phase for both projects, and with the concept and design phase, that's a more refined development of the BRT features, the alignment, as well as a more refined de development of all the identified stops that we have identified throughout the assessment process. And last but not least, the last phase, which is for South Fulton Parkway, the action plan phase. Um, we recognize that we can't do it without maybe potentially more funding. So that's gonna be a, pretty much laying out the next steps of how do we move forward, how do we, how do we put this on the ground? And it'll have pretty much like the you know, step by step of how that process is as well as funding opportunity, funding considerations that how, how we can move forward. Um, but with Roosevelt Highway, that's a more short-term solution. We know that we can get that constructed and get start that construction by fiscal year 2025. So you will start it. When will it end, approximately? Um, and that's going to depend on what we decide as far as like the level of amenities and the station and the structure. So if it's if a good chunk of them are just approved some sites, it could be shorter. If it's if it's a good bit of super stops, then it could be a little bit longer. But one two years potentially. So like I mentioned earlier, we're in the assessment phase now, and a part of that phase is these different um, set, these different components. Um, we are currently in the existing conditions phase now, which is one of the engagement points that, we come, that we're coming to all of our stakeholders, just to make sure, for one, did we capture everything? And so Casey, when she comes up, she's gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the things that we're seeing, some of the key characteristics that we're seeing on each quarter. We've also been meeting with the technical staff for all of the municipalities so that we're walking through and making sure that we have captured everything. Um, GDOT is another one of our technical partners, so we wanna make sure it aligns with some of the work that they're doing, because we would hate to put that kind of investment and then another project comes back and it just messes up. It happens more often than you think, so we don't want that to happen. And so, uh, so, so we're trying our very best to make sure that we're working as close as possible with our partners. Next slide. So like I mentioned, the different engagement points. The, over the next months, we will have three engagement points. We're currently in one now, um, where we've had an opportunity to meet with the mayors, to meet with city councils, um, we've met with stakeholder agencies, such as South Fulton Parkway Alliance, and others that are interested. And then of course we'll have the public meeting, where we'll, it'll be a virtual meeting, giving people another opportunity to be able to get an understanding of the project, get an introduction of the project, because a lot of people aren't aware of it. So we're doing this initial engagement and trying to be as good as possible just to get people interested in knowing what's what. And also for us to make sure we have all the stakeholders at the table. So when we have the next two engagement points, one later this year and one early next year, that will be actually bringing deliverables so that people can look over and make comments.
us and make this so that we can all make decisions together. Next slide. All right. So Casey Mertz is going to come up and she's going to talk to you a little bit about the key characteristics of each of the quarters, and then we'll just wrap up and um, and be open to any questions that you have. Okay. So this is looking forward at our future land use. So you see that big swath of green has changed colors. So we're now in that gold and green and blue. So it's um, and some purple in there. So we're looking at um, more mixed use development, um, some additional um, um, industrial and, and multifamily um, development as well um, coming down the, the pike in the future. Um, so there's really the potential here to build on all of the great work that's happened in the past that Morgan mentioned early on some opportunities to align our transit with um, mixed use and, and higher density um, developments. So um, again, thinking back to Morgan's um, earlier slide about the three different modes that we're looking at, today we have local bus service and that local route um, is Route 82 that serves the parkway today. Um, and you see on the map on the right hand side of your screen is a heat map showing where, the, where people are getting on and off our buses. Um, and so, uh, you know, there's the one stop sort of on the, the western end of the parkway that, that kind of jumps out at you, and that's um, located near some um, warehousing and distribution centers. Mm -hmm. People are using um, the Route 82 today to really to get to work, so they're kind of reverse commuting into this corridor um, and coming for jobs. And so that's something that we're, we're paying very close attention to. Um, and then you'll also see our, the bus route that serves the corridor today connects into uh, the Marta heavy, Marta heavy Rail Station in the northwest corner of the map, and it also ties into uh, routes that serve both national and down to um, uh, Roosevelt at US 29. Excellent. Uh, so another key thing that we um, have to look at when we're thinking of existing conditions is employment. So I just alluded to the fact that a lot of folks are using um, Marta uh, local bus service today to get to jobs on the parkway. Um, and this is where we're finding a lot of the where a lot of the employment exists today. Um, it is clustered. Um, you can kind of see on the on the further uh, east part of the the corridor. But we know that development is occurring also and is planned um, for the central. 
central and western quarter. So we know that's what's, that's what's coming down the pike in the future, and that's what we're paying attention to. Um, and we're also talking to other business groups and, and uh, jurisdictions along the quarter to really get a good feeling for what they're seeing happening so we can prepare for that. Okay, so just a few uh, kind of wrap up uh, takeaway points from South Clinton before we jump into Roosevelt. Um, there's, of course, um, copious opportunities here to coordinate our land use um, and transit planning. Um, we know that that, that has been um, discussed in the past and there is good work um, at the local level that we can build on. Um, we're definitely paying close attention to um, pedestrian and bike facilities. Got my desk in the car. Um, uh, what's out there today and what's going to be needed to build to accommodate the transit service that we're considering um, and making sure that it's safe and, and convenient for people to use. Um, travel patterns, we have a, a, a bunch of really great data that kind of helps us understand how people are using the corridor. Um, even though we have pretty low travel volumes on the corridor, that does kind of serve a little side benefit for transit today. Our transit on time performance for this corridor is, is pretty high compared to the rest of the region. Um, so that's a good thing for people that are using it. We also looked at some origin and destination um, patterns, which really kind of help flesh out that story and, and reinforce the fact that people are using this to get to jobs on the corridor. Um, also, in terms of uh, roadway safety, um, again, relatively compared to other four lanes in the region, it's lower crash volumes. We have seen a slight uptick in recent years, which we want to keep an eye on, um, and also a slight uptick in truck traffic that's you know, associated with the newer industrial developments. And I'm not trying to rush you, but yes. I want to make sure council has, we have another presentation, yes. and I want to make sure that I want to, I, I'll give you another five minutes to get through this, because I want to give council at least 10 minutes to ask any questions that you want to go back. Absolutely, all right. <laughs> Roosevelt Highway, so by comparison on Roosevelt Highway, of course, um, a little bit different picture here. We still do have some relatively low population and employment density and, and lower density development. Um, the biggest thing that we're seeing here that's, that's kind of different from the story I just told about the parkway um, is we're, we're really looking at, the, at more closely at the stock level conditions. And what's really important for us to take note of in this existing conditions work is all of the physical constraints that are out there like the railroad that's right adjacent to the, um, to the roadway, and existing development, parking lots, um, utility structures, those sorts of things, things that don't exist on the, on the park where we've got kind of large swaths of land available to us. Um, slide, please. Um, and so this is uh, some, some just illustrations of some of those physical constraints that we're talking about. Um, and um, again, another trend here that's similar to the parkway is our uh, bike and ped facilities. There have been some really great improvements in recent years, like you know the, the work out here in Fairburn, the LCI project, um, that's really great. But again, um, for the corridor itself, there are still some like substantial gaps that we'll need to address if we're really considering this uh, an enhanced transit corridor. Okay, looking at um, current uh, transit ridership. So today, um, uh, 29 is served by MARTA Route 180. Um, and you can see again here on the map sort of um, some uh, uh, kind of uh, heat map of, of where folks are getting on and off the, um, the uh, bus today. And just like on the, on the parkway, um, they do have great access into the heavy rail system, which people are using to, to use to, to get to the airport and, and to get to jobs. Um, so a difference uh, here between what we did on the parkway and what we're doing on 29, um, really here we're focusing in on the stop specific locations. And so this is just a list of the things that we're doing a deep dive into at each stop location, including uh, this example here at Buffington Road, um, looking at the current uh, roadway infrastructure, utilities that could be um, you know, a hindrance to, to building out stations, available parking, if we're, if we're considering these to be parking ride uh, lots, um, lighting, land use and zoning, again, kind of looking at those um, potential to, to plan uh, future um, developments along with transit enhancement, and then ridership, where are people using it today and where are they likely to use it in the future with enhancements. All right, and then uh, this is our last bit on Roosevelt. This is just a quick look at where we're considering stations. And so again, we are wrapping up that existing conditions phase, and this is really gonna be the heart of our discussion going forward in the next few months, kind of taking a dive and, and looking at, are these the right, the, the right places to look at for stops? 
which stops are um, perhaps um, should be elevated to the super stops, having going back to the discussion with Mark and earlier, um, and which should be improved stops. And these are just kind of some examples of the, the differences between the two in terms of amenities. Okay. Um, just a few takeaways. Of course, um, we've got a little bit greater density than we saw in the parkway earlier. Um, lots of different, um, I mean, both of these, both these corridors touch seven different jurisdictions. So there's lots of opportunity for coordination here. Um, with the jurisdictions and with GDOT. Um, first and last mile connections, so looking at our gaps in um, pet and bike infrastructure. Um, and then again, uh, travel patterns. Um, so very similar discussion, we know people are using this corridor to get to work, to get to their critical um, um, uh, appointments. of where we are in the process and um, of course um, we are you know we thank we appreciate this opportunity and time just to speak to you all um, we're definitely looking for as much engagement as possible as much feedback as possible and I'm trusting the team to move forward in the process and um, this is really like the last substantial slide that everyone has just a question so if you all have any questions that you would like to ask at this time that would be more than happy at this time I'll entertain any questions Mr. Whitmore uh, will start and then Ms. Portis Jones, I can't see you. Do you have a question? There she is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Did she go to sleep? <laughs> go, go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Whitney. <laughs> 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 oh, no. <laughs> Somebody needs to text her. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Whitney. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation, and, and of course, this, uh, this is very important to the city of Fairburn. I know we had a representative from Martyr that came through a couple of years ago, and I know we started some work with some sheltering around the stops that we do have, but it has not gone through completion, so knowing that you're coming back is a plus. But I also noticed uh, when we started talking about Roosevelt Highway, and even in your pictures, you identified, in this case, a Buffington Road stop location <laughs> that probably has a Fairburn address, but it's not Fairburn. Okay, we'll do. All right, <laughs> we so. Have, we have a couple of places. So, these, yes. so this presentation yeah. deck is, is something that it's we take to a lot of our councils, so don't, mm -hmm. so don't think too much into the samples that we put out there, but, okay. but we'll, we'll make sure that you, that you see your folks. No problem. Definitely, <laughs> so that, that was the one thing that I wanted to say, and then also, uh, I saw on uh, the last, next to the last slide that you did pick up the park and ride that we currently have here in the city of Fairburn, <coughs> excuse me, which is great. And uh, that sheltering is good, I observed it. And uh, then, but coming back into the city on 29 is, is a major concern for me. I know we have ridership there, and I just wanna make sure that we have the proper covering for them, especially when we have inclement weather. We wanna make sure that we're taking care of our citizens the right way, so. The partnership with Marty is great, and we appreciate the presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Porter, she's trying to get, while well, she's trying to get on YouTube, go ahead, Mr. Heath. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I used to work with Marty uh, as a police officer there, and um, I noticed that as soon as the, uh, the smaller cities up on the north side uh, built, uh, Marty put a rail station in there. Uh, on 74 Highway, I think this was two years ago, if I'm not uh, wrong on this, it was about a $34,000 uh, car a day count. These are coming in from Fett County, uh, Coweta County, and a lot of other uh, people that live out in the area, not only in Fairburn, but there. And traffic is backed up terribly uh, in both directions, as a matter of fact. But if they could put like a rail uh, station, I think that would be uh, greater benefit uh, than, than to having the bus, to be honest with you, because more people feel more comfortable on a train than what they do on, on a bus. And then, too, you're able to avoid all of the traffic with the train. Uh, I, I can remember riding the North Rail there uh, all the way at that time uh, up into uh, uh, some of the northern cities there uh, that from Five Point Station I'd pick up and uh, I mean, we were like traffic jams all on the expressway, but we were riding on a train above all of that. And, and 
you're able to make better time, I'll just put it that way. So uh, this is something I brought up on a couple of occasions before, and uh, they said that they would look into it, but uh, I never heard back on anything on that. But uh, like I say, I feel like that a rail would be uh, an addition. I know it, it ends at College Park, but just to run it down I-85 in the median, like what they've done in some of the uh, routes up on the north side, that that would be a, a, a great asset to this area. And I think it would help resolve our, our, our traffic problem, to be honest with you. Because in the afternoons, uh, traffic southbound on I-85, we're back all the way up to Highway 138 from 74, just trying to get off to go home. And then in the mornings, they're backed up past, and I know you probably don't know where Milam Road is, but it's uh, a, a little further toward Fed County, uh, Tyrone area. For uh, where our parking ride is at, so uh, like I say, it would just cut down on, on a lot of aggravation for people and accidents because now we're 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 seeing a quite a, a up, uplift in accidents there, uh, tractor trailer traffic. And I know y'all can't do anything about that, but uh, to get the cars off the road, that that I think that would be a great benefit if you could look into that. Uh, maybe we don't have the rooftop count or something. Or whatever you're looking at, but the fact of the matter is, is that uh, if, you, if you live in College Park or above College Park, East Point, all that, uh, you, you're fine. You don't have a problem uh, getting into work in a reasonable amount of time. But if you go just a couple of exits below 130, well, 138 and 74 Highway, then you have a, a major problem with traffic just backed up and accidents on I-85. I mean, uh, I live on. Traffic is backed up, not moving anywhere because of accidents that are taking place between the cars. So this would be not only be a safety thing for us, but it would also help the, the people that uh, do transit to to the Atlanta area for for their jobs. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's the easiest answer I can give you. I do agree with them. Um, yes. However, I will say that a part of this process, and like I mentioned, like we mentioned in the presentation, we look at all the modes and I look at all the, you know, there's a, there's opportunities, there's trade-offs with any of the modes that we select. Um, there's a cost, there's a time, um, all those things. And so we'll be looking through that throughout this process. As far as some specifics regarding that cross comparison, I would be happy to send you something to kind of show you uh, the, the, the pretty much the gamut of from but local bus to yes. commuter rail, and you can kind of see for yourself. So I'll be more than happy to do that for you. Oh, that's Just terrific. Absolutely. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I've got the Councilwoman Jones and some of the Metro Tim on, on Zoom. Ms. Jones, go ahead with your question. Ms. Jones? Can she not hear what it looks like? Is it news? Coming up. Her sound. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's her sound. That's not her sound. That's not her sound. That's more <laughs> the podcast says. That's what I'm saying. That's probably us. I don't know why. It's right now. Okay. She's good now? She's talking. She's, she's talking, 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 but, but we can't hear it. The flashing thing on the left is like etched out with the sound. She doesn't have a question. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. I got one final question for you. Yeah, well, we can fix that. Yeah, in between. Yeah, in between. The okay. The question I have for you, uh, having been, and I asked uh, Mr. Parker this, uh, I want to say in 20, the summer of 2016 or 17, uh, having been Atlanta native, the original plan with Marta was for you to. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, Verizon. <laughs> no, I'm not. Okay. Well, I 
Okay, so my question, my question was going to be, and I'll make it real quick because I want to get to the next one. Yeah, the the original plan with Martin was supposed to go from not starting high tower, was actually supposed to go full industrial, if I remember correctly. And so my mm -hmm. question is, when at the kind of tapping back on what Mr. Heath said, it was pretty obvious during our conversation with the mayors in 2016 and 17 that you could go 75 south for whatever reason because of the traffic. So going 85 south, my question is, is there, is there at least, if you're not gonna bring rail this way, is there a way, is, is there a consideration to go back to your original plan to, to put the industrial so the folk in South Fulton can at least go to a destination yeah. other than straight down 29? Is that even a consideration again? Well, not with this particular study, however, I will say that there has been a lot of conversations that have come up, over, I would say literally over the last few weeks regarding this Fulton Industrial Development in general. Yes, so I think this is something worthwhile for us to just assess and, and just a part of the existing conditions too is just to kind of be aware of any neighboring projects that may be connected or associated. So we'll try to, we'll do our very best to make sure to document that and, um, and identify those if there's some, if there's some opportunity there. Okay. And, and, and my point, and I'll close with this point, my point, it was pretty evident, literally myself, Mayor Williams, uh, Mayor Bodie, I can't think one other mayor, I want to say Holman, um, pretty, was pretty adamant about, that for whatever reason, why we can't get the consideration for modern, for rail to come this way, and that's when we brought up the situation and uh, with the situation with, in this case, Fourth Industrial, because everybody trying to get on the rail, driving, driving to Cox Park or East Point from down 29, it's a, it's a bottleneck, so. That was just a consideration that I don't know if it fell off, you know, this died, but that was something if we can't come this way, if there's any kind of way uh, for it to, uh, for us to consider. So that, with that being said, thank you all so much for your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much, <laughs> thank you. <coughs> and so if uh, we'll go, uh, Ms. Ms. Clerk, could you announce our next presentation? The next item is a discussion on the proposed updates to the City of Fabric Homestead exemption. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council members, and citizens of Fairburn. Good evening. Last month, the City Minister's Office had a retreat with Mayor and Council. During the retreat, the three R's were discussed, refresh, rebrand, and renew. Many great ideas and projects came to light during the retreat. One of those ideas was to take a look at the City's homestead exemption. The City Administrator's Office then shared that idea with staff, and we are here today to discuss our findings and our proposal. Can I get the PowerPoint, please? Oh, next slide. Thank you. Under the City of Fairburn's current policy, the City of Fairburn offers a homestead exemption to the residents within the city limits. This exemption reduces the assessed property value by 10,000 each household may have only one exemption. Rental properties or investment properties are not eligible for homestead exemptions. To qualify for this senior exemption, all of the following requirements must be met. It must be 65 years of age or older by April 1st. Residents must live in the home. It must be their primary. The income requirements for a single individual cannot exceed 15,800. For a married couple, it can't exceed 31,600. You must provide a current driver's license and all vehicle registrations. Next slide, please. The proposed recommendation by staff would be to remove the income requirements. This would allow all of our seniors who are 65 years of age or older to qualify for the exemptions. Next slide, please. Our current policy for disabled citizens is you must be 65 years or older of age or who is disabled by April 1st. Same living requirements if you must live in the city and it must be your primary home. The income requirements are the same as the senior exemption. The only difference with the disabled, you must have three physicians that are licensed to provide medicine in the state of Georgia, must complete and sign a certificate provided by the tax assessor's office to Fulton County. The signing physician must certify that one or more individuals listed on the deed are mentally or physically incapacitated to the extent that they are unable to be gainfully employed and that such incapacity is likely to be permanent. Next slide, please. Staff would also recommend that the age and income requirement be removed. 
all other requirements we would ask to stay the same. Next slide, please. Right now, the question on everyone's mind is this. What is the cost of the city, right? The 2020 census stated that the city of Febron has roughly 1,100 seniors over the age of 65. The exemption tax break is 10,000 off assessed value. This is a savings of $81 per exemption. Currently, we have 174 seniors slash disabled citizens receiving the exemption, which equates to roughly 14,000 of foregone revenue, which means money that the city is not collecting. If approved, these are the potential cost increases. If the, esti uh, the estimates on the screen that you can see on the table, if it increased by 50%, which means another 261 seniors, our foregone revenue will be 21,000. 75%, that's 305 seniors, foregone revenue is 24,000. All the way to 150%, foregone revenues will be 35,000. Next slide, please. Each year, the city collects roughly six to seven million dollars in real property taxes. Staff believes that establishing these new changes would have minimal impact to the city. Our current policy for disabled veteran, peace offer, and firefighters. The city of Febron offers a homestead exemption to residents within the city's limits who are veterans or widows of veterans. These exemptions reduce the assessed property value up to 50,000. Each household may have only one exemption. Rental properties or investment properties are not eligible for the homestead exemptions. Now to qualify for this exemption, the applicant for the property must own and physically occupy the property as their primary residence. The applicant must have lived in a property as of January 1st of that current tax year. Must be 100% service connected disability. Must provide a letter from the Department of Veterans Affairs or Department of Veterans Services stating the qualified disability. Next slide please. There are currently three types of exemptions. The full value, which is $50,000 of excessive value. To receive this exemption, you are the unmarried widow, widower of a peace officer or firefighter killed in the line of duty. And you are a resident of the state of Georgia. The next exemption is the disabled veteran. You also get $50,000 of excessive value. You are certified by the Veterans Administration as having 100% disability. This can be extended to unmarried widow or minor children. Under this exemption, if you are 99% disabled, you get nothing. The next exemption is veteran surviving spouse. Exemptions up to 50,000 of assessed value. You are the unmarried spouse of a military member killed in combat. Next slide, please. The proposed exemptions that the staff has come up with is with the full value, you are the unmarried widow, widow of a peace officer, firefighter, or military member killed in the line of duty. You are a resident of Georgia. So we have combined the full value with the veteran's um, surviving spouse to make it into one. Now the new tax break for that would be 50,000 of assessed value. The next exemption would be disabled veteran 100%. You are currently certified by the Veterans Administration of having 100% service-connected disabilities. So we have decided to change that to 100% exempt. The next exemption is disabled veteran, less than 100. From multiple conversations, city administrator's office and staff, we recommend that if you are a veteran and you have any type of disability, you deserve some type of exemption. So even if you're not 100% exempt, we believe if you have some type of disability, you should have something. So the tax break is 50,000 of assessed value. Next slide, please. So the financials. Could you hold, could you hold on one second? Yes. Chief, would you do me a favor and ask the people that are standing the hallway to because we can hear them because we're trying to hear them. That, that sound is picking up in that system when Mr. Jones is having a hard time hearing. Thank you so much. Go ahead, sir. The 2020 census stated that the city of Febron has roughly 700 veterans. The exemption tax break is 50,000 of assessed value. This is a savings of 405 per citizen. Currently, we have only 77 veterans who qualify for this exemption under the current policy, which means a foregone revenue of roughly 31,000. Excuse me. If approved, the 77 veterans would be 100% exempt, which is roughly a foregone revenue of 48,000. Other veterans who, are, who have disability would not qualify for the exemptions. As you can see on your screen, which would be an up increase of 15,000 if 50% more veterans apply, all the way up to 150%, which is another 193 
citizens, which come up to about $78,000. Next slide, please. Homestead additional information. The value of the residence in excess of the exempted amount shall remain subject to taxation. The homestead exemption shall provide shall not apply to any ad valorem taxes, levied to pay any interest on and retire any indebtedness. During this process, staff researched multiple cities and reviewed their current homestead exemptions. We believe that the recommendations presented today is the best fit for our city. We want to thank you for bringing this issue to our attention and will now open up the floor for any questions. Does any member of council have a question with regard to this? Ms. Davis? I have a, and then Mr. Whitmore and, and Ms. Jones had one. I put her out with Mr. Whitmore. Okay. I, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. I just want to, um, it's been like two years trying to get this done. <laughs> um, from mostly the previous administration. And I want to thank um, you, Mr. David, for taking on this and coordinating this. I want to thank Mr. Phillips for his leadership and seeing the necessity and the expedience to get this done. And you all did it within six months of your administration. And I've already done my happy dance when I saw it in the booklet. <laughs> because I think it's, it's so needed. Um, and the one we had before was like 20 some years old. And it had um, income requirements and stuff like that. And you've taken that out. Not only that, you've expanded it to like our firefighters and our veterans and, and their disabilities. And I think it is much needed. Our city is saying to our citizens, we care about you, you know, and we understand the situation that you're in. And, you know, maybe uh, limited income or what have you due to various things. And you are saying, we see you and we are going to help you. And I, I just appreciate it. So I'm trying real hard not to <laughs> get too emotional. <laughs> but I really, really appreciate your diligence in doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Whitmore and then Mr. Jones. Thank you, Mayor. My comments are similar to my colleague. Uh, and as a vet and also knowing a lot of vets here in the city, uh, this is going to be a plus. Any way we can assist those that uh, went out and fought for our country it's a way of showing honor to them. So just by the city doing this, it does mean a lot. And I thank you, staff, for your diligence and researching and coming up with something that is palatable that we can actually activate and make happen in our city. So I want to say thank you, staff. Uh, Ms. Jones. Mayor Pro Tem. She's needed. Mayor Pro Tem, can you unmute your microphone? Uh, while you're trying to bring her in, let me make uh, I have a comment as well while we're trying to get her in. Uh, yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. Um, I I too want to echo the sentiments expressed by my colleagues. Uh, I'm very very pleased that uh, that has this has been brought forth. Yes, I am very pleased that this has been brought forth um, to mayor and council for uh, review. Uh, and approval. A couple of questions that I have. One, um, was uh, the home exemption uh, program of Fulton County uh, evaluated as part of this process? Uh, and two, uh, I am uh, pleasantly pl pleased and surprised that the widows or veterans are included in that. Could you provide uh, the cities that include um, the widows uh, of the veterans? The, we looked at nine different cities um, from Palmetto, Union City, Douglasville, Riverdale, Fayetteville, 
um, Petrie City, Forest Park, Jonesboro, and Sharksburg. Our current um, homestead exemption was originally created from um, Fulton County, so it's still based off that as well. question. Yes, uh, thank you. So I have, um, I'm, I'm trying to watch it on YouTube because I'm having difficulty hearing. Um, what was the, I'm sorry, um, what was the answer relative to, uh-huh? Um, the cities that we looked at was Palmetto, Union City, Douglasville, Riverdale, Fayetteville, Sharpsburg, Petrie City, Forest Park, and Jonesboro. In the current okay, all of those cities in this part of this Yeah, process. all those cities. Um, all of the cities include uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, the widows, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, that is fantastic. And um, lastly, could you develop a spreadsheet laying out um, all of the categories and the requirements to meet those categories? I think that'll be uh, an easier document to communicate to um, us as council, or me specifically, uh, as well as to those citizens who would qualify. Yes, ma'am, I can. Is that possible? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, and again, uh, thank you for taking on this endeavor and in such a short period of time. Um, really, really appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. This is just a, a plus. Other question I'll, the only question I'll ask as it relates to the verification, one of the verifications we use in my office is that uh, the, instead of asking people to keep up with the two, DE form 214, we'll ask them to be certified, either bring ver verification through vet biz. That may, not be a, that may be a great organization for you to list vet biz. If they're certified as a disabled veteran with vet, vet biz, guarantee you it's legit. And so my, uh, Wooden County, I believe it's the city of Atlanta, and I want to say possibly modern now, uses vet biz as a backdrop to make sure that, and what that does, that saves, that saves my, uh, the county, the uh, other agencies, all the verification mechanism because they go through an extreme. In this case, uh, vet biz actually will require, uh, as long as you're 0.01% disabled, you're good to go. So that just that, that information will probably save you a lot of time. So Thanks. unless any other member has a Question. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, I, I just want to say that uh, most of the other counties and cities that I know of uh, offer uh, something extra for our veterans. After all, they, they volunteered or either were drafted. And uh, when I got out of high school, everybody was being drafted. But you know, they they went and they fought for this country, and it looks like that. Uh, and, and I'm deeply uh, uh, delighted the fact that we are doing something special for them as well. Thank you, that was all I had to say. Ms. Danielle, if I may, uh, it would be our intention uh, to bring this forward as a regular council meeting for your consideration and approval. If passed, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, we will work with our communications consultant if it receives approval to make sure we communicate this in a very effective way to all our residents and veterans. They can easily understand the changes and how it applies to them right. and their property taxes. And lastly, I just want to commend Mr. David and his staff. They did an outstanding job on this. He did a great job of building a really professional finance team, and several of the team members contributed. And I just want to acknowledge their hard work on this. Awesome. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, with that being said, that was our final item, uh, correct, Mr. Phillips? That, that's our final item in the workshop. Uh, I believe we'll stand adjourned until 7 o'clock.
we want. Fortunately, to get the, the, the delay that we have. Yes, hold on one second. Okay, yes. have to Thank you. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get ready. We're going to get ready to start our meeting. Break our meeting in the quarter. Before I start the meeting, can I just get a show of hands uh, for uh, the item, the Liberty Community? Can I just get a show of hands of how many people here? In, first of all, I'll start with in support. Can, it's a port. Can I see a show of hands? Okay, okay. Can I see a show of hands of folk that's in opposition? Okay. In my in my efforts to stay within the guidelines as a set for a public hearing, uh, if you if you have a person that you know may can, a spokesman for your group, so that way you don't it, you don't you don't have the same people getting up ten people getting up saying the same thing, and you don't end up talking about the substantive issues of what you want conveyed. So if, you know, in the meantime, before we get to that agenda, if you have a spokesperson, it's totally up to you. But then, you know, we have to allocate 10, 10 minutes per the code. No, it's not to exceed 10 minutes for 10 minutes again, but I want to make sure in my efforts to give both sides quality time. If you have a spokesman, it's totally up to you. That's your decision, not ours. So, uh, but with that being said, I'll let you guys decide that between now and the time we get to that item. Ms. City, uh, uh, City Clerk, would you go ahead and uh, call a role for the city council, thank you. And thank ladies you. and gentlemen, before she gets to that, let me just uh, make sure I announce, we have a council member by Zoom that's actually an international, that's actually overseas, but she's on Zoom, so please bear with us as we deal with a, a delay, Zoom delay as a result of it being international. I just want to make sure you're, you're aware of what's going on. Thank you so much for your understanding. At this time, I'll call the meeting to order. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, James, to call the role of the council. Honorable James Whitmore. Present. Honorable Ulysses Smallwood. Present. The Honorable Alex Heath. Present. The Honorable Pat Pallon. Present. The Honorable Linda J. Davis. Present. The Honorable Mayor Pro Tem Hattie Portis Jones. Present. Is present. Mayor, you have a quorum. Okay. At this time, if everyone would stand as uh, Pastor William O'Neill. Present. Okay, go ahead, sir. Honorable Mayor. Father God in heaven, we thank you and we praise you, God, for giving us your light to always come boldly before your throne of grace that we might find help in our times of need. God, we thank you for your presence today, and we ask that you be present in this meeting on tonight, God, so that agreement can happen, because we know that without agreement, uh, it's impossible for things to happen, but with agreement, all things are possible. God, I pray right now that you will continue to bless this great city, O oh God, and all of its residents, business leaders as well, God. And Lord, we pray that you will be with this city as we continue to refresh, rebrand, and renew. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Our pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God,
time we do not have any presentations or Members of council, uh, uh, at this time, I'd like to add an item. I need to add item number seven to the agenda for a resolution appoint an authorized special council to represent the city of Fairburn to the negotiate a local option sales tax. Uh, in this case, can I get a motion to adopt the agenda with that item added? So, so move. Second. Motion is made by Mr. Whitmore, second by Mr. He. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. At this point, uh, approval of our city council minutes. Yeah, give me one second. You have before you a city council minutes that uh, commenced on May the 23rd, 2022. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Is there any corrections? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion carries. At this point, we'll have our public comment. Our public comment, 30 minutes will be allotted for public comment. Each speaker shall be limited to three minutes. However, uh, a speaker may transfer his or her three minutes to another speaker, but no speaker shall be permitted to speak for more than six minutes. Further in the event, if more than 10 speakers is out of speak, each speaker will be limited to two minutes, and no speaker may speak for more than four minutes. Issues raised at this time will be generally referred to the city administrator for review. Responses will be provided at a later date. Uh, Ms. City Clerk, how many speakers do we have? Mr. Mayor, we have four speakers. We have four speakers, so we'll, we'll stick with the three minute interval. Uh, would you go ahead and call our first, first speaker? Stephanie Pugh. Mr. Mayor and City Council members, good evening. My name is Stephanie Pugh. I am speaking on behalf of my mother, Diane Lee, and me at 8850 Gallette Road, my uncle, Donald Lee, at 8830 Gallette Road, and many in the neighborhood. We are adamantly opposed to the project. I have a lifelong connection <coughs> to this immediate area. I was born and raised at 8850 Gallette Road, which is very close to the subject property. My mother still lives at the property, which I co-own with her, the subject property was originally owned by my grandparents, and my uncle still lives adjacent to the subject property. As one of the leaders of the Lion Creek community, I have had the privilege to work with many neighbors who also oppose the Liberty Communities Project. I have spoken with most, if not all, of the neighbors who own and reside on properties from Gallette, Johnson Bohannon, Kleckler, Mann, Creekwood, Landrum, Kirkley, and Goodland Roads. Everyone I've spoken with agrees that this proposed development is not in the best interest. Our concerns have been expressed to the city's planning and zoning staff in the planning and zoning committee hearing on May 3rd, direct and directly to the Liberty community team. We strongly oppose this high density development. It does not fit into the character or landscape of our existing community. It would dramatically increase the traffic, which according to Liberty's own traffic study, will generate 1,877 new car trips per day. That incredible traffic load coupled with a significant volume of unlawful traffic, tractor trailer traffic, continue to escalate the disaster on our roads. This in turn will force Fairburn to expand and signalize the already dangerous four-way stop at Gallette and Johnson at the city's and taxpayers' expense. Additionally, per the study, schools are already overburdened and overcrowded. We have two meetings. We had two meetings with the developer. The first meeting was informative in that they int introduced the project and asked the community for feedback. The second, second meeting held after the project was recommended for denial by staff and voted against by the Planning and Zoning Committee was a total waste of time. Going into the second meeting, we were under the mistaken impression Liberty had taken the prior input seriously and were ready to present a significantly revised plan. Instead, they wanted to, us to discuss our already stated concerns as a pretext to urge us to accept the change embodied in the project they proposed. They did not listen, but instead were argumentative. They did not offer a revised project that would conform to the existing one house per three acres. Agricultural zoning, but instead want the community to support their significant up zoning. Their approach seems to be characterized as when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Rather than choose to work with the community and submit a project that conforms to the current zoning, both the developer and the landowner shifted 
two threats. One of the Liberty spokesmen made the comment on the second call that it was better to accept this than something worse and followed them by standing Ma'am, at the your, time, your time is up, I apologize. Can we go to the next speaker? Donald Lee. That's my uncle who is going to give me his time. Okay, where's Donald? Okay, where's Donald Lee? Okay, go ahead. Accept something worse and followed <clears> on <throat> by stating that the landowner wanted to make a lot of money so we needed to just accept it. Since then, several neighbors have reported that the landowner has approached them asking for their support of Liberty's project. When confronted with their opposition, he has reportedly become agitated and angry, threatening to use the property as a pig farm for the sole purpose of, quote, stinking up the neighborhood, end quote. This mean-spirited and unproductive approach has only stiffened our resolve to oppose this highly inappropriate project. In the developer's ruse to work with appease the community that have appease the community, they have only angered us. We as a community deserve better than idle threats. We are tired of people wanting to make money off their personal property and pushing the costs onto us, the nearby neighbors, and onto the taxpayers of Fairburn and Fulton County. In closing, we are asking you to stand by the 2040 comprehensive plan. As the Planning and Zoning Committee did, we are asking that you uphold the AG zoning and preserve our community as you promised when this plan was agreed upon and put forth. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Yes, ma'am. Uh, next speaker. D. Thompson. Good evening. My name is D. Thompson. I live at 8735 Dillap Road. I'm one of the original members of the Lion Creek Community Association back when we had trouble with Mr. Lacey trying to inundate us with a bunch of small matchbox homes. We have fought that. We have fought to preserve our land. We have fought to have done away with a warehouse. We're inundated with trucks. We have had other proposals for this property. I, myself, think that it's time that we looked at it rationally. If the density is in the area of 145 to 150, I think it would be a good area for nice homes to be built there. I am not associated with Liberty. I have never had any association with Liberty. I spoke with a gentleman from Liberty just last week. The young lady that was here prior made the comment that she had spoken to everybody. Her mother lives just down the road from me. No one has spoke to me. Nobody has approached me saying, we don't like this. I don't like it either, but there is going to be something done with this property. I think that this would probably be the most conducive use of this property if you have gone and looked in, in Palmetto at the other homes that this company has built, they are quality homes. The homes that they have proposed here, from what I've seen and what I've heard, are going to be of a better quality. I think that it's time that we quit fighting everything and finally came to the conclusion that we need to get something that is beneficial to our community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lydia Glaze. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening, Good evening. staff. Thank you. Um, I only came because this is not the where we actually say we're for or opposing uh, liberty no, homes. I want to use my time to say, first of all, as a citizen, for 33 years as a resident, I'm very excited about uh, what we've seen online with refresh, rebrand, and renew. I think there are just some good things that are happening, just um, the meeting prior to, just taking into account our veterans, uh, those who have been disabled or lost their lives in public safety. I wanna say to me that is high time that we have done this and look back to our community and saw our leaders who have fallen, who have gotten harmed and we've done something about it. I want to say thank you, Mayor and Council, uh, for and staff for bringing that. We, the community, are responsive to the wonderful things 
that are happening, and that's just one of them. So I only came today because we're open back up. I hadn't been in City Hall, hadn't seen some of the folks, and I just wanted to say thank you. What I'm hearing and what I'm seeing is good, I appreciate it, and it's an honor to continue to be a resident of this great city. And I will be back to share a little bit about Lime Creek and what's happening there. But thank you again. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last speaker, Mr. Mayor. Now we think, uh, at this point, we will now uh, finish our public year, I mean, finish our public comment. At this point, we will actually go into the agenda item. Uh, this clerk would you announce our first item and then I guess we'll have the staff. The first item is a public hearing on the rezoning 2022-030 Liberty Communities LLC. And this is for mayor and council to consider the rezoning of 46.1 acres from agriculture to R4 single family residential. Okay, I'll let Ms. Peak speak first. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good evening. Good evening. Liberty Communities, Communities is requesting to rezone 46.1 acres from AG Agriculture to R4 Single Family Residential to develop a 151 lot single family residential subdivision with frontage on Johnson Road and Gallette Road. The proposed minimum lot size is 6,200 square feet with an average lot size of 6,929 6, square feet. There are two proposed ingress and egress points to the subdivision on Gallette Road. An amenities package includes a walking trail, passive recreational area, and, play, and a playground with 12.6 acres designated for open space. There are two single family residential subdivisions in the vicinity of the proposed development, Asbury Park and Creekwood Village. Lots in Asbury Park subdivisions are 3,800 square feet and Creekwood Village lots are 10,890 square feet, which is equivalent to one fourth acre lots. The applicant hosted two community meetings, one on March the 24th and the second meeting on May the 26th to discuss the proposed development with nearby property owners. 14 people attended the first meeting and 13 people attended the second meeting. Based on the applicant's public participation report, the following issues and concerns were expressed. Density, size and cost of the homes, increase in traffic and road entrance, sewer capacity, noise and light pollution, impact on the school system, homeowners association and the impact to Lion Creek. After the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting on May 3rd and the second community meeting, the applicant reduced the number of lots based on um, conversations with the community from 175 lots to 151 lots, which is a reduction of 24 lots. Based on the proposed development's inconsistency with the 2040 comprehensive plan and the future land use map, staff is recommending denial. The Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed the request on May 3rd and their recommendation is denial as well. If the rezoning request is approved tonight, staff recommends the 17 conditions listed on pages eight through nine of the staff report. And Mayor Avery, we have the applicant representative here tonight, Mr. Greg Heck, who also would like to present to the council and to, to you as well. Okay. Uh, what I'll do, I'll start with again, as I mentioned about the 10 minute, in this case, Ms. Uh, uh, Ms. Ross, can I ask you a question if you don't mind? My question would be in, in him speaking in support of council for time. I just want to make yeah, so, yes, so in this case. Time will be included in the entire 30 minutes available for those that are in support. Okay, gotcha. Go ahead, Mr. Hay. You'll have 10 minutes. You might have to make sure I maintain because I'm sure there's a rebuttal at the end of this. And th this is part of the part of the 30 minutes. Correct. I'll start now. <laughs> Mayor, Council, we appreciate you being here. And we appreciate all the citizens who are here for us and against us. We do. Uh, people may remember that previously in the city of Fairburn, with some of the same people, I came here and opposed an industrial development because I didn't want trucks to come in that area that would clog and some of the issues that came with it. As a result, I have a fine uh, builder that I've known for now over 20 years that as part of another group and now this group I have great respect and admiration for and think they build great homes and I may have a 
uh, obviously a different perspective than some of the folks here, but I'm grateful for you telling us what your perspective is. As you know, you have seen probably in the packet that I've given you in this blue folder, you can see in it kind of what Liberty's idea is in here. And you'll see in here that it's approximately 46 acres, which Chris Eden owns, and this is his retirement property, and he needs this, he's about to retire for his savings, and it is his property, and he needs to do something with it. So he, as you can see in the first slide here, what's around this area, it's fairly close to M1 property, which is something that I stopped previously with the help of the city and with these folks. And now we're proposing something right next door to Asbury Park and very close to other subdivisions, which is housing, which is the least intrusive use you can have in comparison to what would go there, as opposed to a severe agricultural use, which I don't think there was any threat. Mr. Eden is a farmer and has said, if I cannot make this into houses, then I'm gonna have to do something else with it, and that's just the facts of what he wants to do. But if you look around here particularly, and, and there are people that have signed a petition actually to support it as well. Val, if you come up and bring that too, that I, I do wanna present as part of this. But you'll see in here, you'll see rem remnants, and you can get that, uh, I'll just present that. They can go to the mayor and council. I think you'll see also in the very back of your packet something that's important that I hope the community understands too. There was initially a project that Smith Douglas had brought in the very back of your packet, it's beyond the packet actually, where they originally were submitting for 190 lots to the city originally. Our builder came here and said, I don't want to do 190 lots. He said, let's down it and went to 175 lots. We had a community meeting, and we listened to the community citizens who we respect and appreciate, several of which were my prior clients. And we listened, and we, at the second community meeting, said, what if we reduced it by 20 lots? And they said, no, we don't want 20 lots less. We don't want this. And so instead of 20 lots, we reduced it by 24 lots to 151 lots. And I think you can see that also in the very back of your packet as well. You'll see a little bit of a larger kind of 11 by 17 that kind of is a little bit easier to see that shows you those 151 lots. And, you know, I don't, I don't mind just going around as well to the community. So I don't want to be around that process. But we did listen. In addition, you'll see something else. Originally, there were certain models in this type of house, and the community said, we don't like it. And we said, okay, we'll upgrade it. So we did and we upgraded to farmhouse style houses, which is also in your packet as well. It raised the price, and now the houses are in the 350s to 400,000s each. So we've lowered the number of lots, we've increased the cost because we listen to the community at more cost to the builder and less lots and less homes to the builder. In addition, this has much less density than you have Asbury Park next door. So the first thing the city attorney is probably gonna to talk to you about is equal protection of the law, as well as subdivisions around there. And the fact that M1 is very close by within 2,200 feet, which you can see as well. And also at the very last meeting, you'll see in your own minutes, that the DRB group proposal was with greater density than ours, approved when we have less density. So of course that's gonna be an equal protection issue that we're gonna to have to bring up. If this is denied, no one wants to do that. What this builder wants to do is work with the community and has worked with the community. And they may not like everything because what they asked for, which I understand, what they said was we would like to have one to three acre lots with houses starting at $700,000. Now, I understand that. It has some particular difficulty to me. I will tell you that this is gonna be a family friendly neighborhood that you can see from the from there, there's several acres of great green space, walking trails, a lake, beautiful playground. And yet, um, I understand wanting one to three acres and $700,000, but I wanna talk to you about how this and who this means will not be able to go into this community if you had that. Now, I put in your packet, as you will see, who the city employs. It employs police officers, firefighters. In this area are nurses. In my family are lots of educators. 
and you can see I put the prices in your packet of their employment. And your median income in this city is $55,000, which is on your website. So if you do what I appreciate what these citizens want, I do. Everybody wants one to three acres of $700,000 houses. The problem is, when I was an assistant district attorney, and when I was a Clayton County staff attorney, I couldn't afford that. And I was fighting to protect people from child molesters and robbers. And my friends who were testifying as police officers couldn't afford that. And my friends who were testifying on arson cases who were firefighters couldn't afford that. And the median income of your people here can't afford that and they can't live there. And what this says is, and, and I put some other statistics in there for you so you know it. This is, frankly, this is not affordable housing. This is middle income family housing. And so I did put some statistics on what affordable housing is. The Atlanta Area Housing Foundation shows that there are 340,000 Metro Atlanta families that are cost burdened with one third of their income going to their mortgage, which they, it says is unsustainable. I put a second article in there that by Senator Ossoff's office that said there are 200,000 shortage of affordable housing units. I put a third article in there, all of these are very recent, it said that rents have gone up 85% in the last two years. And there's a fourth article that says 60,000 affordable housing units have vanished over the last five years. So I understand wanting $700,000 houses and one to three acre units. You've got two minutes, sir. go ahead. But I, I can't abide by that because I lived in one of these subdivisions and I loved it. And I grew up in it. And my first child was born in one of these type housing, and for frankly, houses that weren't as nice as this. But I was very happy, and I've made lifelong friends from those. Down in Jonesboro, I was very happy, and I appreciated and loved all my neighbors. And some of them were actually the opposite political party than I was, and I still love them. But the point is, I think there's an opportunity to make a difference here. Now, I believe in this. I believe that you should have neighborhoods that are open for firefighters, for teachers, for educators, for nurses, you have the salaries right there. You have supporters right there. And I get it. And in terms of what we have done, well, we've lowered the number of lots. We've increased the prices of houses, probably that are not, they're affordable for middle America. They're not affordable for poor people, and we sure as heck ought to do a lot more for poor people as somebody that spent 10 years in Habitat for Humanity and a prior president that I was and has been a housing authority attorney, I can tell you this is not affordable housing for poor people. But it's a start for middle income people that you hire right here at this city. And if any one of your employees can, can afford a $700,000 house on three acres, well, okay then. But if they can't, I hope everybody here will think about that before they yell at me coming forward, because I disagree, but I love you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. At this point, we'll take speakers that are in opposition again. Uh, yes. Oh. Okay. At this point, did I have anyone that's still in support of any other supporters of the application? Seeing none. Going once, going twice. All right. Council, everybody. Um, Chris is my uncle. Uh, he's been dealing with a lot of cancer surgeries. He's in pain right now. He couldn't be here, unfortunately. Can you speak in the mic, sir? Um, um, yes, my name is Scott. Scott. Yes. Um, and uh, he just wanted me to relay some some words. Uh, he's uh, owned this property for the past twenty something years. He lived. He's lived in this. Uh, city for the past 25 years, a quarter century. And um, he's been a farmer and pilot um, flying out, out of Atlanta airport for these years and uh, been making payments on this and another property nearby. And um, since he's sick right now, he needs to uh, retire and um, needs that. He's uh, actually, we were, uh, He's tried everything. He's tried. Uh, he had a uh, lot of sheep and goats and cows there at one time. Tried to make some money with that, and you know, pay the taxes and pay the payments, 
and that didn't work. He didn't bring enough money. And uh, actually, before um, the great people at Liberty came, we were uh, contemplating on either a, a pig farm or a chicken farm, which uh, my dad has experience in. Um, and um, luckily, I mean, th through the grace of God, they came, and this thing's coming together now, uh, finally. And um, yeah, just, you know, he's been on a lot of medication. He's not, he hasn't been himself the past uh, almost a year now. Um, but, um, you know, we are very excited about this. I think it'll uh, uh, create, uh, it'll raise the property value in the area. Uh, it will uh, cause a lot of, uh, you know, good neighbors getting together. There's, a, uh, I love what they're doing with the park. There's a park gonna be there, you know, 12 acres. Um, so we're excited about this. Just wanted to relay some, uh, the message from my uncle. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That concludes the people that are in support of the item. I'm clocking this. Okay, the, uh, I would now call the people that are actually, anyone that wants to speak in opposition, <coughs> uh, according to that, uh, you, you can come on up, just come on up, sir. I see you sitting there, and then the lady in the back, I saw you. You can come up to him, and you can come, Ms. Glaze, and then just Orderly, and again, I, at this point, I'm clocking at 12 minutes because I have to, I have to maintain the codes up. 30 minutes each side. Is it? So, I, so I can get 30 minutes. So in this case, okay, 30 minutes. My name is Joel O. I stay on Creekwood, Creekwood Road. Yes, sir. And I'm, I'm really talking uh, for the people in Creekwood uh, subdivision, and uh, they keep talking about uh, on that corner there right now. As it stands right now, we got trucks coming up Creekwood, down Johnson Road, they're not supposed to be coming. I, and I look at this thing here now, as it stands right now, if we should call Fabulous Police down there, Fabulous Police, the fire department, the tractor trailer will be backed up there on, on uh, Oakley Industrial, we can't get out. We have to go almost to Palmella to come to Fabulous, because the traffic is so rough. So if they put these other houses down there, that's no telling how much traffic is really going to be. You know, I mean, we're looking at uh, if someone gets sick down there, we need an ambulance, they're going to be able to get to us. You know, I am a dis I'm a totally disabled Vietnam veteran, and as it stands right now, if I should get real sick, if I need an ambulance or something, I I'm going to. I mean, it's simple as that. Uh, I don't feel like they're going to get to me in time. So I'm, I'm against all that, you know, all those houses. That's, entirely too many houses for them acres of land. I mean, I, I might be, I might go along with, you know, three houses, I mean, one house on three acres of land or three and a half acres of land, that might be all right. That will eliminate a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of people, a lot of traffic. But as it stands now, I'm totally against it, and I hope that we can take care of this. Thank you. Can I get your name, sir? My name is Joe Lowe. Joe Lowe, thank you. Hmm? Next speaker. Mayor, City Council, thank you so much for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, my name is Darcy White, and my husband, Tom White, is back here. Um, we live at 375 Man Road in Tyrone, so we're here representing uh, your neighbors in different municipalities, and again, appreciate you taking the time to listen to our concerns as well. Um, we want to, I think as a group, well, first let me say that I'd like to have Stephanie Pugh's remarks, which were eloquent, <laughs> entered into the record, if you don't mind. Um, and you know, as a community, we aren't against development on this property. We, we truly aren't. Um, and, you know, I think Mr. Hecht, who used to, who um, would have been here representing us, but for he found another, uh, another client that, that he thought uh, had a good, good argument. Um, we, and when we met with the community, when we met with the builder, um, and the point that Greg kept making about one, uh, one house at 700,000 on three acres, that was meant to show that there is a very wide berth between the zoning and what they're proposing. And so our question was, why can't we be somewhere in the middle? We're not against having a development that maybe even has a little more density than an agricultural zoning, but it should be a lot closer to what's actually in the 2040 comprehensive plan. Um, you know, and I have some sympathy for somebody who wants to, to monetize their property and, and especially in the owner situation, 
but you know, we all bought our properties there, uh, knowing that they were agriculturally zoned and knowing that that was supposed to be that way into the future, and that's part of why we bought it. And so, um, you know, as far as a taking, <laughs> if the committee, of course, uh, approves this, then it's kind of a taking from us too, right? Because our properties are gonna be devalued based on this density the increase in traffic, the increase in potential um, environmental problems with Lion Creek, um, and just the you know the the strain on the public resources, and those are those are roads and, and resources aren't that aren't just for Fulton but also for Fayette County where we live. Um, I also sent an email to you guys earlier today. Sorry for clogging your inboxes, but it lays out a lot of arguments about why we oppose this development, this particular development. Um, and we are not opposed to affordable housing, though, you know, as Mr. Heck points out, this isn't that, um, but it is uh, housing that's dense, and I guess some people could afford it. Um, but we just want a, a development that makes sense for our community, and there's a whole lot of room between what they're proposing and, and what is required per the zoning right now. Um, so with that, I, I'll cut my remarks short to allow other people to have more time. Um, but just wanted to note that there was a constitutional notice of reservation of rights uh, that I signed and that many of the community members here signed, um, just, to, just in case uh, you all decide to approve this, this project. But thank you again for the time. Next speaker. Thank you again for allowing me to speak in opposition. Uh, this um, com proposed community. First of all, I want to say our comprehensive plan 2040 was a plan that took into account the entire citizenry of this city and we spoke well. You heard us. It is documented. That is the guiding document. And right now, our planning and zoning has stayed with the document and said that this property or this proposed property does not fit the plan in this community. So with that stated, I want to say that this is the oldest and most organic community left in Fairburn. That should say something. I moved here 33 years ago because of this type of community that existed in Fairburn. We have in every way taken advantage of growing and opening the door for middle-class America to move to this city and to have a life that thrives and that has quality. I think we know that AG1 is still necessary, still wanted, and still a part of our comprehensive plan. So we want to stick with that because that's inclusive of what we see as Fairburn's future. And we want to stand with that uh, AG1 with the Lion Creek community. We spent thousands upon thousands of dollars making sure that Lion Creek um, was, that, that bridge was there, that it was intact. Mayor, we actually did an opening with that and made sure that, that traveling in there was safe, the bridge was safe, because we felt like that community was important to us. We still feel that that community is important to us. The reduction of quality of life with that many homes would be felt by everybody. And what happens to one side of our town happens to the other side of our town. I'm on Rivertown Road and I don't want any more of my quality of life diminished and nor do I want what we've already agreed would be the, the quality of life in the Lion Creek community. So I stand here today in support of our community being intact, being in its most organic state. The state of Georgia has put money in its budget to make sure that this area still have agricultural training, education, and a young farmers program. Why? Because it's essential to the economy of Georgia. Farming, Agriculture is a still a part of our everyday lives, and it's a priority in Georgia. I stand here and say that our state budget supports this type of community and this type of making sure that we preserve and conserve. So my question today is, what can we do outside of the comprehensive plan to put more teeth and so that we are not coming back every month 
trying to diminish what we have agreed is what we want in this community, and that is to make sure that we have an AG community that is intact and that they don't have to be afraid every month with a new developer coming with a new idea that does not meet our comprehensive plan, that does not meet the quality of life, that our community the, in its most organic families to this area has not agreed with. I think today we need to close the book on developers who come to say our plan is not the plan they want. They don't live here. They don't pay taxes here. We do. We want our voices heard. Thank you. And next speaker. And furthermore. <laughs> John Phillips. I'm Aaron Phillips' granddaddy, if you know Aaron. Um, I live on uh, Snake Road, they call it. <laughs> and they call it Snake Road for a reason. And I'm seeing up to 500 more cars on Snake Road. I've seen some awful things go around there, and, and it's scary. I, I go up there sometimes and get on the curb. I live on a bad curb. And I go up there and watch them, and you just can't put 500 more cars on that road. You just can't do it. I mean, I saw the school bus that's come that close to having a wreck there. Go around and saw the truck on the wrong side of the road on the curb. That road is not made for, for what they're proposing. Thank you. Next speaker. Mayor, City Council, my name is Neil Nichols, 6805 Man Road. We're at the intersection of Man Road and Glatt Road, about 800 feet from the property in, in, uh, at our subject here today. Um, I own and operate a cattle farm, and I hope my cows don't stink too much for the community. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of really great points made, and I'm you know, not going to go over every single one of them. I'll tell you, today, I was done making hay in one of my fields along Glatt Road. And I came out to turn on the glad to head back to the house in the barn. And a tractor trailer came over the hill, going way too fast. And I'm in a tractor. And uh, we almost had to call on uh, our wonderful fire department here. Thankfully, we didn't have to. We didn't have to put a strain on our emergency services. <clears throat> but you know that happens pretty commonly with me in a tractor. It certainly happens with folks in cars coming in and out of there. And you know, to the point, the road's two-lane road. It can't handle the additional cars certainly can't handle the trucks that are already there, and that's a separate problem that we all know we need to address. <clears throat> but the strain on the fire and emergency services is only going to get greater. We know that the strain on the schools is going to get greater. Utilities, all these different things. You know, th this is something that really jeopardizes what's really a fairly fragile part of the community in, in that sense. I mean, it's, it's just not made for this kind of scale. <clears throat> I appreciate the point made about Georgia investing in agricultural areas and in young farmers. I think I'm still a young farmer, <laughs> although uh, with, with three kids, one who's a one, th one month old, I, I don't really feel so young at the moment. <laughs> but I'm proud to be a farmer. I'm proud to be farming in Fulton County. We've got 113 acres that we, thank you, 113 acres that have been cared for by folks in this room for many generations before me. I'm really proud to be able to bring my generation, my three kids up in this community, in an agricultural world. And I'm happy to share that with the community too. I love it. I, I'd welcome everybody to come out and see the farm. So <clears throat> this is an important part of the community. And to the point about affordable housing, I certainly understand the need for affordable housing. I really think that a community is made up of a variety of housing types, businesses. It's a patchwork. That's a highly functioning community. We need affordable housing. What's, what's to say that you don't have a mixture 
you know, in a development like this of housing that meets the average AMI, as well as houses that are $700,000. I think that's a great system. You see that happen in a lot of communities. I'd love to hear a proposal that looks like that. Um, you know, I, I think a, a homogenous proposal is, is one thing, but you know, let, let's, let's hear some ideas. I mean, we're open to it, truly. Darcy White and others have said that. We want to hear it. Um, that, that's all I'll say. Um, again, I just want to say, uh, as others have said, the comprehensive plan really lays it out for us. And I just want to thank the Planning and Zoning Commission and Planning and Zoning staff for relying on that document. It's a community-led document and it's a community-trusted document. And we hope that you all put your trust in it as well. Thank you. opportunity to speak. My name is Elizabeth Corcoran. I live at 9075 Gallat Road. I am the esteemed neighbor of Neil. If you have not met his cows, you probably have met my horses at some point <laughs> who don't seem to believe that fences apply to them personally at all times. <laughs> I bought my property here in 2006. I moved specifically to the south side of Atlanta because I enjoyed the pastoral environment here. I grew up in Atlanta and I can remember when there was no such thing as Alpharetta. And the reason that I come to these meetings pretty much every year that we have one of these proposals come forth is to say that when we let go of that land, we can't get it back. In Georgia, we actually, in December, our state senator came and announced at our farm that there was funding now available for equine-assisted psychotherapy, large because of programs like ours and specifically in Fulton County. There is less and less opportunity for people that live in cities to experience a farm. There is less opportunity for children. When I was growing up, we played outside. Kids now, it is a rarity for them to get out into an environment with animals and flowers and sunshine. I don't have a huge farm like Neil. I only have 17 acres, but I know the power of that 17 acres for the children that come to my farm and heal there. And I know that seeding any of that land, once we've built more homes and shopping centers and offices, that never goes back. That land where you have the opportunity to have space and air and freedom gets further and further away from where most people live. It is not to say that there shouldn't be affordable housing. It is not to say that police officers and teachers and nurses don't deserve wonderful places to live. It is simply that part of what Fairburn has been committed to and what I love about Fairburn was the comprehensive plan and the opportunity that the council gave us to come and sit at a table and look at different types of neighborhoods and then sit with maps and say, hey, this would be great over here. Hey, could we save this for green space? And that is what we did as a community. So it isn't anything about what we want for teachers or policemen, it's about a vision that we bought into when we purchased property here. And it is true, I, I have known Chris Eden since 2008. He also owns another large piece of property on Johnson Road that he recently was able to sell as agricultural property. So I don't completely agree with the concept that there's only one way to fulfill what he needs. And I don't agree with the idea that the needs and desires of a full community that already are here have to be juggled against an individual's interest or a builder's interest. I just don't think that that's what the plan was about. Thank you for my time. Thank you. Is there anyone else that wished to speak in opposition? Good evening. Good evening. I'm Chelsea McClinton Jackson, and I live in the city of South Fulton, my church is St. Matthew's, around the corner from the proposed development. I cannot top what the past handful of folks have said, nor how well they've said it, but I have to contribute that these folks who want to build up this area are, have some of the same faces as the folks who are already building over 400 homes over by Wilkerson Mill Park and additionally, there's another large development going up over by the Renaissance Festival property. And there are two more by the fire station. 
one taking place of the horse farm. I think that's only 12 or 14, but one that's much, much larger backing what's now a warehouse where there used to be an airport. At some point, this is too much. This is too much development. I had a critical health problem at one o'clock Sunday morning. I drove to the Fairburn Fire Station right over by the park and I waited over 40 minutes for an ambulance to Piedmont Fayette Hospital. If I had been having a heart attack, I would have been dead because that firefighter told me, no ma'am, we can't take you in your car. And I couldn't reach anyone in my family that was closer than 40 minutes away. This is not sustainable and it's not good for the folks who live here. And just as this young lady said, we moved here for the pastoral environment, not to live cheek by jowl with folks and have the lines to get onto the interstate stretch back farther and farther and farther while we hope that the tractor trailer drivers can see our vehicles. Thank you. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. How you doing, sir? Uh, my name is Mike Berlanti. I live at 9265 Galat Road. And uh, approximately 20 years ago, we were unincorporated Fulham County. And we were facing the same type of thing, development within the area. And the city of Fairburn came to us with open arms, and they said, we annex you, and we'll protect your way of life. And you have the comprehensive plan, which will guarantee that your way of life will be protected. And I, I don't know. Many of you may not have been with the city back then. Uh, some of you were younger. But uh, you know, I just wanted to bring that up, is that there was a promise made. And for that, we paid taxes for 20 some years. And I just think you should take that into consideration. Uh, it's a beautiful area. And it, we'd like it all to maintain that way. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else who wish to speak in opposition? Okay. Young lady. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Carrie Clarl. I live at 203 Mann Road in unincorporated Fayette County, but it's close to this proposed development. Um, these are quotes from the comprehensive plan, the current comprehensive plan. Preserve green space in the southern area of the city. Keep rural agricultural feel in southwest part of the city. Build homes with larger lot sizes in areas outside of downtown. Keep rural agricultural feel in the Line Creek area of the city. All of these points support the denial of the current rezoning request, which just does not align with the land use plan. Land use planning is the process by which community leaders establish a policy for the use of land to facilitate the best land development for the general welfare of the area's residents. No landowner is entitled to a rezoning that is out of character with the land use plan. This rezoning to permit a high density development would drastically alter the character of this part of Fairburn. I ask you to please deny this rezoning request and ensure that this part of Fairburn is preserved or developed in a manner that aligns with the city's comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other speakers in opposition? Yes, ma'am. We've got five minutes left in this phase. Go ahead, ma'am. My name is Colleen Curry, and I live on uh, 9135 Glit Road, just down from the barn and across the street from the, from, from the, um, the caps. Um, I like to walk on the road. I go to my neighbor's house behind me, down to the barn, down to the, uh, the cows. And I almost gotten hit by five times by, uh, by trucks, by people driving 55, 65 miles down that road. And I almost gotten hit by 18 wheelers flying down that road as well. I like walking a lot because it's exercise and it's, a, and it's, this, it's free space. 
Thank you. Any other speakers in support? Seeing none. Uh, Mr. Heck, do you have an opportunity for a rebuttal? That total rebuttal was five. Go ahead, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Council, and neighbors. Uh, my name is Mark Akampora. I'm the traffic engineer who did the impact study for this project. I just wanted to hit a couple of highlights, a couple of issues that were brought up by some of the neighbors. Um, one, the traffic study that I did was based on actual counts that were done out there. We recognize that there's a lot of growth coming in this area, and so we increase those volumes to develop future volume projections by 100%, and then we added the traffic that'll be generated by this project. When we evaluate the intersections out there, we assign them a letter grade like a grade in school, A through F. The intersections out there are operating at a level of service A. After the 100% growth and the addition of the traffic from this proposed subdivision, the levels of service are between A and B, depending on the movement. So they're all excellent. So there's a lot of capacity out there. Um, so the roads are not jammed up, at least in the immediate vicinity of this project. They're not jammed up. Uh, I did hear a lot of people express concern about trucks. Um, I just want to point out that this residential subdivision doesn't generate truck traffic. Um, this is surrounded by a lot of industrial uses. There are trucks being generated out there. Um, perhaps the city, and I'd be happy to be a consultant, could look at ways of diverting trucks, controlling trucks. Um, it may be an enforcement issue, but um, that issue should be separated, I believe, from of the traffic issues from this project. So we have a, tr a, tr a project that's gonna have some impact out there, but after everything is developed, it will still be operating at very high levels of service. And I'd be happy to answer any specific detailed questions about traffic that you all might have. Thank you. There's two and a half minutes left. Okay, go ahead, sir. Sorry, this is Scott again. I, I'm a, not a great public speaker, as you can tell. I failed to mention uh, before uh, the great people at Liberty came, uh, we had, uh, we were contracting 1,500 heads of hogs to be uh, moved here from another location uh, with a slaughter license. And, uh, you know, we were going to do organic and sell the manure and stuff like that. Uh, we also, before that, we researched chicken farm and their profit margin is about the same. It was 50,000 heads of chicken that we were going to purchase and move into the location. So just want to let you know that I forgot to say that. Thank you. Briefly, what I was going to say is the subdivision is much lighter use. We stopped that use, and I don't think actually that Mr. Eden wants to necessarily farm more. He owns property that he's owned for decades, and he's tired, and he wants to sell it, and it's his property. And I appreciate the comprehensive plan. I've been involved with comprehensive plans but they don't trump the constitutional right of somebody's property use. They've been challenged many times. People want to say, you have to keep 46 acres agricultural for the rest of your life. Those usually lose. It's okay. He has his own property rights. But my point is, we put in a constitutional reservation of rights as well to protect his and other people's rights to live in a property that's affordable that's for middle-income families. Now, let me say this. If the mayor and council believe they're going to deny this, I would ask you instead to table this and allow us to talk further with the community and see if there is something. Uh, you heard Darcy White say, maybe there's something in between. Well, maybe there is, and I know Darcy. She's a great lady, and I believe it if she says that. So maybe there's an opportunity for us to talk more. Maybe there's more agreement, as the Reverend was saying, than there is division. Thank you. Okay. That actually completes the total 30 minutes allocated. So. <laughs> In this case, uh, at this point, members of council, I'm just going to bring the item to the floor for the for the discussion. At this point, you have before you for mayor and council to consider the rezoning of 46.1 acres from AG Agriculture to R4 Single Family Residential. Is there a motion? Uh, I, uh, just to double check, Ms. Ms. Porter Jones uh, is is by Zoom. I'm trying to make sure. Is delayed. 
and needs to be a motion to, or the item comes back to us eventually. Motion. Need a motion for it to come to the floor. Yeah, to motion just to, to come to the so floor. So move. Second. Okay, motion has been made and properly second. Any questions or concerns by members of council? Go ahead, Mr. Whitmore. Uh, I, I have a couple of uh, staff. I'd like to talk to staff first. <clears throat> I understand you, we already went through the planning and, and zoning side of the house, and uh, with our lead attorney for planning and zoning, but just in, in reference to the recommendation, uh, the inconsistency with the 2040 comp plan and future land use map, would you identify some of those inconsistencies? Maybe I missed it. Yes. So the comprehensive plan has this area designated as rural residential. That's a character area that's in the comprehensive plan. Um, the comprehensive plan, the overall um, comprehensive plan, the character area is residential. And in the residential character area, there's three density um, categories, rural residential, rural residential, low residential, and medium density residential. And so this particular property is identified as rural residential in the 2040 comprehensive plan and on the future land use map. And so those, that particular density requires one acre lots or larger. Okay, thank you. And I've written down a lot of things here, but I'm not going to take up a lot of time. Uh, but I do know that uh, a mayor and council, along with staff, uh, when we were re reviewing the comp plan and the, um, and the uh, usage map, future land use map, and we had a agent, uh, Michael Hightower's firm, that spent a lot of time looking at Fairburn as a whole, the various designations throughout the city, and they came back with recommendations to the citizens and mayor and council. We spent a lot of taxpayers' money doing that. But we did that because we wanted the input of our citizens as well as our great staff. And then mayor and council listened and we approved what we currently have in place. And, and I think that's a, a very, very key note that we need to consider. Also, I, I heard uh, the applicant mention constitutionality, uh, equal protection of the law. Uh, Madam Attorney, we have done everything that we are required to do because we have a comp plan and a future land use map that is approved for 2040. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So in light of that, after all the reviews that we have gone through, uh, and it was tedious for staff, I remember some of that, uh, but we did have input. We had citizens coming in and adding a lot of value to what was being presented. And I, I think we need to keep light of that. On top of that, <clears throat> knowing a vet that actually has the use of horse therapy because of some of the things that he has gone through while fighting for our country, that's a plus. As well as having children that actually use that type of therapy as well. That stays home with me. <clears throat> the public engagement was there. Uh, we have the 2040 comp plan and the future land use map. You know, we have Everything that we need, and really, I didn't sit in on planning and zoning, but I, I would assume it was a very good meeting, and we came out with the results that we had there. So I'm just saying to mayor and council, based on everything that I heard here, uh, and based on the fact of, of the inconsistencies with the 2040 comprehensive plan and future land use map presented by the applicant, not us, because everything that we have is on file, available for review. I myself cannot support it, Mayor. I'm just speaking for me. Next speaker, Ms. Davis. Uh, yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, there's uh, 
clarification that I want to make in reference to the representative for the uh, applicant in reference to the properties um, Ashbury Park and Creekwood Village he alluded to those properties um, I just want to state um, that those properties were annexed they were in Fulton County and they were annexed into the city of Farron and they were permitted to stay the way they were so I just want to bring that up for clarification um, the other thing I want to say is that our 2040 comprehensive plan is a plan it's a plan that we put in a, uh, I am in uh, concert with my colleague we put a lot of money a lot of time in that comprehensive plan you cannot just let any developer that comes into the city that you think well maybe this is a good idea or that's a good idea in this area it has to be a holistic approach and that's what the 2040 comprehensive plan is about it, it involved citizens it involved staff a representative from council consultants there was input discussion so it's a holistic approach for the city of Fairburn and just last council that 2040 comprehensive plan was a plan that we stuck to and for with our decision these are not haphazard decisions that we have to make they're very serious decisions and so that's what the plan is for to go by the plan so I'm um, I'm also I'll publicly say I'm, ag I'm against this um, development for this part of the city of Fair. Do I have any other comment by members of council? And again, we're on a time delay. Ms. Portis, uh, Fair Pro Tim, do you have a comment? Assume she does not have a comment. Okay. Uh, okay. At that, at that point, what I, was, I had a couple of questions I did want to ask. Uh, as a, um, <clears throat> and again, I'm in total agreement, believe it or not, with both comments made. Um, just for clarification purposes, if, if my question is going to be, uh, as one of the residents mentioned, this you know this has been an ongoing, I guess every year or two years, whatever like that. My question is going to be, the, the next developer that comes here, my question is, our, our comprehensive plan, we had a conversation, actually me and the city administrator had a com uh, conversation, if I'm correct, is that plan updated every five years? Is that, is that this, oh, I'm sorry, miss, I'm looking at the city attorney, but actually she's talking. <laughs> yes, the plan is updated every five years. However, um, if it's the will of council um, or staff and there's needs for revisions in between that five years, it can be amended at any time. Okay, and so my, my question about that was, and the reason I'm asking about that, uh, just give me give me some type of insight. What what creates a major shift in a comprehensive plan? In this case, in a five year plan. Whatever. I would say if um, me and Councilman Davis was talking about this during the break, if you have a particular area of the city where the vision or the goals of the city change, where area may be agriculture or it may be industrial and the city wants to see that particular area move to um, a better suited use, say from agriculture to commercial or from residential to commercial, then you could amend the comp plan to um, a character area that will suit what the city is trying to pursue as far as development into the future. So a good example, a lot of cities, uh, we're fortunate enough to have a downtown, but a lot of cities who don't have a downtown, they amend their comp plan to a character area that will get them to eventually having a downtown. So that will be like your downtown mixed use types of development. So they will have a character area that speaks to where they want to go in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And so, uh, and, and members, members of the public, the reason I bring that up, as we look, if you, give, if you go on, and I think uh, one of the council members actually referenced it, you'll go on the city website and look at the three R's where we looked or we're looking at 
the different areas of the city. Again, I'm in total agreement right now that uh, you, that you need to stick with your comp plan, just, I mean, just so you know where I am. But one of the things I'm having to be realistic about is that areas that I think the gentleman said have been 20 years that he met with the city of Fayetteville. And so uh, I'm just, I'm forced, I guess, forecasting that uh, this area again, uh, it, it is, I, I'm a firm believer, I love farmland, I love agriculture, I make that no secret. Uh, one of the things I want to make sure we're realistic about, what is what, what creates a change in this, and that's why I asked it publicly, what creates a change so that way we're not having a conversation four years from now as it relates to what happens or what, how in the world could this happen again? Mr. City Manager, if I'm correct, isn't there a public outreach required in a major change before, I mean, again, I want to make sure the public understand we don't, you don't just arbitrarily decide you're going to shift. Uh, Mr. Whitmore uh, stated it very clearly as I could, the, the time and money that's put into it from the government, but also there's a, there's a public input. I just want to, I, I think it's important that we speak openly and candidly about what happens, how do we get to this point? Well, one of the foundational elements of comp plans is public engagement. Mm -hmm. So even in those instances where there may be some occasion or some reason to amend the comp plan or to revisit, it's not uncommon that market conditions change much more rapidly than we revisit the comp plan. Um, the world is very different today than it was five years ago. But with that said, one of the elements of comp plans that make them useful is public engagement. So okay, even in gotcha. the instance where there may be some need to amend the plan, you do so in concert with your residents to make Correct. sure that whatever is developed or amended is consistent with the will of the community and all of our key stakeholders. Okay, that, that, that's, that's the point I was trying to make sure I bring up. Uh, and Mayor Avery, may I add to that? Yes, ma'am. Um, if, if there's ever a chance that um, this body or staff would like to bring something forward to amend the comp plan, as um, Mr. Phillips has stated, you do have to go through a public hearing process. Correct. So communities are engaged in that, and they have to they have an opportunity to come and speak in support or in opposition if there was an amendment. Okay, correct. Uh, before I take a vote, I just want to make sure I know we're on time today. Ms. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, did you have a comment? I'm actually trying to talk to her through the phone and <laughs> through Zoom. Okay, she. Okay. <laughs> Okay, with that being said, uh, there, uh, is there anyone, I'm sorry, any other member of council have a comment? No. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Mr. Mayor, there. Oh, oh, I mean, Mayor. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, She's that's right. In this case, we brought it to the floor. Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, go ahead, Ms. Jones. Go ahead. She's muted. Better for me to dial her on his phone because the Zoom. Yeah. Wait one second. Okay, you get it. Oh. see her pick it up. Okay. I'm, I'm going to try on this phone then. If not, then I'm going to go ahead. Yes, ma'am, you can go right ahead. Okay, thank, thank you so much for the opportunity. And again, my apologies for um, the communication is much delayed uh, and I'm having difficulty hearing. Uh, but um, I do want to 
So the comments regarding the comprehensive plan um, that uh, we work uh, very, very hard uh, in engaging the community, getting feedback and ideas about what the vision that they had for Gerber. Um And that uh, comprehensive plan has been tested over and over again with the numerous uh, developments um, that have come before us. Uh, and I think we, um, as a governing body, um, have heard you and uh, both for um, ideas and projects and against ideas and projects. But at the end of the day, we go back to the plan that we all agreed upon um, as to the direction uh, that we want the city to go. And so I appreciate uh, the comments from the citizens uh, in referencing uh, the plan. That is really uh, heartwarming to know that um, it is being reviewed uh, and that that hard work continues to um, um, move us forward. And so I just wanted to comment regarding the comprehensive plan uh, and the fact that we just um, approved the update. Um, I believe it was 2019, is that correct? No, it was actually last year. It was adopted last year, the yes, five year update. Yes, um, and again, uh, every five years. Uh, but things are moving rapidly here in Fairburn. And so we, uh, there are a lot of things that we're going to have to take into consideration as we update the new plan. Uh, so thank you, Mayor, for um, the opportunity to comment, comment on this. Uh, and thank you, uh, the residents of Fairburn, for coming out, hearing your thoughts, and uh, continuously being engaged in this process. I personally appreciate that. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. With that being said, is there a motion? Mayor, can I ask one question before uh, you? Uh, no, sir. No, no sir. Uh, 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 Mr. Mr. City Attorney, if I'm correct, that's, that's, that's not out of order. That's out of order, correct? No, no, sir. That's that. That's uh, that. Rob, according to Robert Rusa order, you cannot do that. We've already we've already passed that period of the meeting. Well, okay. Well, I'm I'm going to ask. Bear with us for a minute, ladies and gentlemen. Mayor, if, yes, ma'am. Um, it, it's it's too late. It's already that's, been advertised and placed with the agenda. And that's that's what I thought. Uh, Mr. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, there's not a not an opportunity for that. It's already been on the agenda according to the city attorney's rule. That item has to be voted up or down or whatever. So at this point, I'm sorry, sir. I cannot I cannot allow you to I cannot allow you to come continue to come in, sir. I appreciate you. Uh, at this point, is there a motion? Uh, on by any member of council to approve or disapprove. Uh, yes, Mayor. Disapprove. A motion has been made to disapprove. Is there second. a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Ms. Uh, Davis. Any questions or comment by council? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. That motion carries. Item denied. <clears throat> Please depart, please depart quietly, ladies and gentlemen. We, our meeting is still in order. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, could you please could you please depart quietly?
next item is item number two. Okay, good. Go ahead and announce the next item. The next item is item number two, rezoning 2022-031 Herman Creek. This is a public hearing. Okay, let me go to this. The applicant is requesting to rezone 26.35 acres from AG Agriculture to R4 single family residential to develop a 57 lot single family residential subdivision with frontage on Herndon I, Road. Hold, hold, Hold on, hold on, hold on one second. You have to leave one of those doors open. That's just Robert's room. We have to leave one of the doors open. <laughs> I can't afford any technicalities. <laughs> so, okay, you can leave it half cracked. Okay, gotcha. Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Ms. P, continue. The proposed lot size is one fourth acre, which is 10,890 square feet. The proposed ingress and egress points to the subdivision are on Herndon Road. An amenities package includes a playground and picnic area and 3.38 acres designated for open space. The fairways at Durham Lake subdivision is adjacent to the subject property. By comparison, the lots in the fairways at Durham Lakes are of similar, if not smaller size between 0.18 to 0.25 acre lots. The applicant hosted a meeting, community meeting on March the 11th at 6.30 to discuss the proposed development with adjacent property owners and approximately 26 people attended the meeting. Based on the applicant's public participation report, the following issues and concerns were uh, expressed. Access along Herndon Road, in particular foot traffic, whether an HOA would be in place, rental restrictions, price points of the homes, product quality and design of the homes. The future land use map has the subject property designated as medium density residential, and this character area is appropriate for one fourth or smaller lots. Based on the proposed development's conformity to the 2040 comprehensive plan, staff is recommending approval conditional. Staff also recommend the 17 conditions listed on pages eight through 10 of the staff report. The Planning and Zoning Commission reviewed the request on May 3rd, and their recommendation is approval conditional. And you have Mr. William Dial here, Mayor, to speak. He's the applicant's representative. Okay, uh, at this point, I'll open the public hearing. I'll start with those that are in support. Uh, you want to go ahead, sir? Good evening, William Deal, law firm Thompson O'Brien. Can you, can you pull the mic yeah, up and speak? I'm, I'm sorry, Mayor. Uh, William Deal for the law firm Thompson O'Brien. We're located at Tucson Court, Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Uh, Mayor and Council, thank you for, for giving us the opportunity to present this project. I represent the applicant. Um, as staff mentioned, we're requesting a change from the zoning designation. This property is currently zoned agricultural. We're looking for an R4 zoning designation that would allow uh, for the development of 57 single family lots uh, on this property. It's a 26 acre lot property. Uh, resulting in a uh, density, a net density of around two units per acre. Uh, the lot size, we are taking advantage of a, of a lot of common space that we're going to build out, including some amenities that will be built out for this project. Um, the, ultimately, these, these lots will be one-fourth lots, which as staff mentions is consistent with the comprehensive plan. Uh, this is in the medium density uh, residential comprehensive plan. And as we heard in the last hearing, that is the highest purely residential uh, uh, or excuse me, character area in the comprehensive plan. Uh, and this is consistent with it. Not only is it consistent with the comprehensive plan, but it's consistent with a recent development uh, that's directly adjacent to our property. That's the Durham <coughs> Lakes um, development. In fact, many of those, those homes have, have similar square footages. Many of those lots are, are actually slightly smaller. Um, and again, we're building out uh, uh, common areas within this, so there will be a green space element, just as there is with uh, uh, the Durham Lakes community. Obviously, not a golf course, not enough room for that, uh, but certainly uh, amenities, so a playground, picnic facilities. Um, we also, and this is this is in the uh, the packet that staff prepared. Uh, we've shown some of the elevations for the buildings that we're proposing. These are high quality uh, buildings going to be using high quality cladding. Uh, the elevations show there are architectural standards that are consistent with the higher end of the market. Uh, you'll see the, the stylistic gables, uh, many of the, the changes in, in textures and, and of uh, material usage that you would associate with 
uh, quality development. My client is, is here tonight. Uh, my client's been involved in a lot of these similar types of projects. These are high, high end, uh, very well developed uh, projects. Um, we had, as staff mentioned, one community meeting. We had about 20 people, 25 neighbors uh, attend that meeting. It was over Zoom. Um, and they expressed those concerns that, that staff mentioned. So uh, one of those were foot traffic along Herndon Road. Of course, this is in close proximity to a school. And, and one of the biggest concern was the existing foot traffic on this street doesn't have sidewalks. And so as a part of our plan, we've developed sidewalks along Herndon Road. Uh, to address that concern. The other concerns, and, and I think these were all speaking to, um, to a common kind of concern, was will there be an HOA? What kind of amenities will be there? And, and I think what we're getting at is how can we be assured that this is going to be well maintained? And so my client, and these are within the, the conditions recommended by staff, uh, my client will have an HOA, that HOA will have conditions, we will make sure that this is properly maintained. Uh, both by the homeowners and those common areas will be maintained by the HOA. Um, and so with that, if I, I'm not sure if there is any opposition, uh, but if there is, I'll, I'll reserve the remainder of my time. Is there anyone else here that wish to speak in support of this item other than you? Okay. At this, at this point, I'll ask to speak to anyone that here that wish to speak in opposition of this item. Uh, you, you, you're either speaking in support or uh, opposition. Uh, at this point, uh, ma'am, either you're either you're the public hearing and keep it in order. You're either in support or, or opposition. That's the only, uh, only way you get to speak. You. You, okay. At this point, there's no opposition, so the public hearing is technically closed as a result of having no no opposition. Uh, at this point, I can bring the item. I can bring the item to the floor. At this point, you have before you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. you have before you a rezoning <clears throat> for mayor and council to consider a rezoning of a 26.35 acres from AG Agriculture to R4 single-family residential based on the proposed development's conformity to the 2040 comprehensive plan and future land use map. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. second. Motions made and properly seconded by Mr. Whitmore. Any okay. motions made by Mr. Heath and second by Mr. Whitmore. Any questions or comments by council? Go I ahead, Mr. Mean, Whitmore. Uh, staff. <coughs> and the applicant had already uh, addressed uh, one of the major concerns that uh, we have had as elected officials to make sure we have a, a HOA so that, that the, the community is well maintained. But I don't believe I saw anything in there about uh, rental, making sure that we put some of the same language in there that we have for the other communities that are being built throughout our city. Uh, I think it's imperative that we ensure that in this case, a 5% cap for rental so that we can minimize losing out on potential home buyers versus rental because that causes an issue. It's not added, it's part of the zoning conditions, but I think that's something we can entertain with the applicant at this time and if there's a percentage um, that you and the applicant or the body and the applicant um, feels is an adequate number, um, hopefully they'll be open to whatever that number is, and we can add it to the conditions and make that part of the record. Thank you. Mr. Applicant, did you hear my concerns? I, I absolutely didn't. I was just speaking with my client. I, my client's intention is, is to do fee building, so this would be sold on the market. And, and typically, you know, we, we would hate to limit the market that we would have if there is some investor that is looking to purchase this for rental facilities. Um, if there are conditions, that's, that's the will of counsel. Um, you know, we, we would ask that it be increased above 5%. 5% would leave us at, uh, we would be at, what, 10 units, I believe? Oh, that is, no. not, that's not, it's less than, uh, it would be like it two be and a half. Two, two and, and a half, half units. However, that let me That was terrible say, math, and I'm very sorry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so, something. let me 
verbalize another concern that I have now. S certainly. Because what you just said alarms me. Uh, I, we already went through this through Durham Lakes. Where we had one street where a developer came in and he built homes and he led us to believe they were going to be sold for residential mm -hmm. and they turned out to be all rental. That's a major concern. Certainly. Certainly. And in light of that, that particular street is not like the rest of the community. Mm -hmm. So now I'm even more so concerned and I want that number a lot higher for rentals. You know, so I am going to now propose that as one of, con one of the conditions, we take the uh, uh, rental up to 25%. Can I, can I ask a qualifying question? I, I think I may have misunderstood. Can, can, is it you were proposing a 5% cap? A 5% cap meaning that in this case with 57 homes, that would be 10% would be 5.7, so it would be 2 point whatever. Sure. Okay. And, and I've, I've spoken with my client. If there's a condition for 25%, that would be acceptable. 25%. Now, I'm going to ask another direct question now. Yes, sir. Based on your representation, it sounds to me that they're building to sell to investors. Is that the case? No, I, I, and I'm sorry. I, I didn't want to appear that they are selling to investors. These are going to be sold, sold on the market. So these will be sold through a real estate broker. Um, you know, there is, we don't know who's going to purchase the home until, until there's a contract. Uh, but th this is not being developed for a, an investor. OK. So in light of that, and because of where we stand right now with the uncertainty, I would like to put that as one of the conditions uh, for this particular development, the max at 25% for rental. Hold on, uh, hold on for a minute. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Uh, it comes to the next person. The next person was her, and then I'll come to Mr. Smallwood, because then I have a question. Actually, Mr. Jones is after Smallwood. Go ahead. OK. Um, I have a, a concern in Ms. reference to communities being built for home ownership and developers are building them for investors. I've done a lot of research on this. In fact, the um, American Human Rights Division is calling it a human rights mm -hmm. issue. Atlanta is a targeted market for that. In Fairburn, we do not want, it's a major difference between a renter and a homeowner. Mm -hmm. So that's why we are so compa compassionate yes. or passionate about these rental limits. Um, and so we need to get clarity on that. Now, we have been consistently asking for a 5% cap on rentals. If this is a homeowner's community, it should remain that way. And, and that is the American dream. And if we have a lot of renters in there, it does not continue to be the American dream. It becomes an American nightmare. Mm -hmm. Property values decrease and everything. A bad inflection and reflection on the city of Fairburn. So we really need to have some discussion on those limits, that, that rental. This is very serious with us, I know, with me. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to answer those questions, I think I sent off an alarm on yeah, you did. By, by, <laughs> by mentioning investors. Th there is absolutely no intention of this being developed for an investor. And, and if, there is, if there's a rental cap that council would agree to, we would ask that it be above five, because we, we aren't working with that many, many units. Um, but but the, the rental cap that, that's been asked for, my client would certainly accommodate that. The intention is to build product that's on the market. It was just a clarification, because I know we said five, but then I heard 25, so I would just. So if I can clarify, ma'am? Yes, sir. I, I'm so I'm sorry. I got very passionate about something that I heard, and if you know me, I can be very passionate. Okay. So, no, the, the the cap. My recommendation to this body is to have a cap of five percent, because that's consistent 
with what we have done with previous developments that are being built within our city. And, and there's a reason for that, as you just heard one of my colleagues mention, mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're really geared towards community. Certainly. And with that, you have more of a buy-in when people are purchasing mm -hmm. versus renting. So I, I, I got a little carried away. It, <laughs> That's it will be 5%. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so go ahead, Ms. Smart. With your yeah, that's all I was saying. I was trying to clarify because we've had this issue previously, and uh, five is our standard in Fairbairn. And uh, as you know, you can see from the previous public hearing, we are a community in one side of town next to others, and we want to maintain a quality of life in Fairbairn. So yes. um, I'm in agreement with the five percent because that's what we, um, you know, have typically put out there. Okay. Ms. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, she's still on the phone. Yes, uh, Mayor. Uh, I wanted to um, get clarification. Well, first of all, um, I am, am in total agreement with my colleagues regarding um, the rental cap. Um, I, I think uh, that stabilizes our community. Uh, and continues to reflect um, the vision that we have for it. So I fully support that. My question is to Ms. Peek. Uh, regarding a uh, uh, point of clarification, did you say that uh, the current zoning for the property is agricultural? Yes. Okay, um, and the request is for R4? Yes. Okay. Given the previous uh, proposal that was uh, brought before us, could you please explain um, your recommendation regarding moving from agriculture to uh, R4 relative to this particular project? Yes, ma'am. So the comprehensive plan, again, has this area designated as medium density residential. And so the density um, for that is one-fourth acre or smaller. So when the comprehensive plan was um, compiled and the character areas were identified, that particular property was identified as medium density residential because it's right adjacent to um, the fairways at Durham Lakes, which is a medium density residential um, designated character area. So it's consistent to the surrounding properties as opposed to the first item that was on the agenda. The comprehensive plan has that area designated as rural residential and the density is one acre lots or larger. So that's the difference. Even though they both are zoned AG, the comprehensive plan designates the density for all of the city, all of the land within the city. So those are the differences in why one says rural residential and one is medium density residential because of where they're located in the city and how you want development to um, happen in those particular areas of the city. Thank, thank you so much for that. And I wanted uh, that explanation to be stated for the record to uh, re-emphasize that um, all of Fairburn is not the same, that we have what you're showing me as character areas, um, neighborhoods that requires um, one type of development versus another. Uh, and I ask that at all times we remind ourselves um, of the uniqueness of the particular neighborhood and why you are um, proposing one recommendation over the other. So I really thank you for that. And would you also, uh, lastly, to just say what some of the other conditions are uh, for uh, this development? I think she's asking me to state the conditions. Okay. okay um, the first one is to restrict the use of the subject property as follows to single family residential, a maximum of 57 single family residential lots with a density of 2.6 acres. I'm sorry, 2.16 units per acre, whichever is less. B, to abide by the following. The property shall be developed in conformity with the site plan prepared by Lowe's engineers and attached as Exhibit B. 
The site plan is conceptual only and must meet or exceed the requirements of the city's ordinances prior to the approval of a land disturbance permit. Any deviation from the site plan is subject to approval by the city's Department of Community Development. Two, property maintenance shall be accomplished through a homeowners association in which membership shall be mandatory. Property maintenance for the lot shall be accomplished by the individual property owners with the exception of common areas to be maintained by a homeowners association. Such association by law shall be subject to approval by the city administrator or designee and shall be recorded with covenants that shall be subject to approval by the city administrator or designee. And if the will of council is to add the 5%, it will be added in this particular um, zoning condition number two. Yes. Um, C, Thank to the you. following site development standards. Development standards for each single family lot shall be as follows. The front yard setback is 25 feet. Side is 10, the rear is 25, the minimum lot square footage is 10,890 square feet, which is a one-fourth acre lot. The minimum heated floor area is 1,400 square feet. The minimum lot width is 50 feet. A minimum of 3.38 acres of the total area shall be reserved for open space. An amenities package shall include a playground and a picnic area. Number three, facades of the home shall be constructed with a combination of two or more of the following, following materials, fiber, cement, siding, wood shape, clapboard, brick, and or stone. The use of vinyl or ephus, which is synthetic stucco, is strictly prohibited. At least 25% of the front facade shall consist of at least 25% brick or stone. Number four, two car garages shall be provided for each single family unit, upgraded garage doors with architectural elements shall be utilized. Sidewalks on all street frontages shall be a minimum of five feet and shall be constructed to comply with the requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act standards and the City of Fairburn Development Standards. Five foot sidewalks shall be provided along both sides of internal streets throughout the development and shall be designed to provide interconnectivity to the, to the amenity area and mail kiosk. Pedestrian scale street lighting shall be provided along both sides of internal streets throughout the development. Number seven, the perimeter landscape area abutting the public right of way on Herndon Road shall contain mature trees to create a natural landscape buffer between the roadway and the rear of the houses facing Herndon Road. Newly planted trees shall consist of one or a combination of the following trees, Leland Cypress, Easter Red Cedar, Southern Magnolia, Virginia Pine, Arborvitus? Arborvita. Okay. Savannah Holly, Nellie R. Stevens Holly. Number eight, all utilities shall be installed underground throughout the development area. Number nine, acceleration and deceleration lanes shall be provided at the proposed driveway connection unless a traffic study demonstrates that the total traffic on the existing road is less than 2,000 vehicles per day, including traffic projected as a result of the proposed development. Count of existing traffic must have been made within one year of the development plan submittal date. Number 10, turning lanes shall be required to meet provide projected traffic demand and or safe operations as determined by the city engineer and or traffic study. When provided, turning lanes shall meet the following criteria. A, provide not less than 100 50 feet of storage length of arterial roadways, provide not less than 100 feet of storage length for collector roadways, B, provide taper lengths of not less than 100 feet, C, longer storage and taper lengths shall be required when traffic projections indicate they are justified. Number 11, the developer shall construct roadway improvements, pavement, signing, striping, curb and gutter, and drainage along existing roads across the entire property frontage where required at no cost to the city. The developer shall, number 12, the developer shall install a canopy, an understory tree in the front yard of each single family unit. The front and rear yards of the single family units shall be sodded. That's it. Ms. Jones, you still have Thank you so much. And, um, uh, I think it's uh, pretty important for our residents to know the conditions that uh, we place um, on, on the developer. Uh, and if they are going to accept those conditions, we will hold them accountable um, in making that effort. Uh, this is um, to echo the comments that both colleagues put forward and they 
way that um, uh, you spoke about relative to our decision making, uh, and that um, with the expertise of staff, that they're providing us very detailed information uh, and informed information so that um, our decisions reflect that. So thank you um, so much for that. Uh, Mayor, do we need a substitute motion to include the five percent? Uh, Ashley, uh, Ms. We, we, a substitute. No. motion made, but it needs to have with approval with the conditions. You could actually make a motion with the approved conditions. Mr. With Heath has already made the motion. Uh, you, no. So, it, so we I'll, haven't made a motion. We, Mr. Heath made a motion. He said so moved. And Mr. Whitmore seconded. That was to that bring, was it, to to bring it to the floor. Right. Okay, well, he didn't say bring it to the floor. He read, okay. the, read the motion, and you said so moved. Well, we'll do it. We'll just do it, Mr. Heath. Would you just make the motion again? Would you make the motion again? Gotcha. Go ahead, Mr. Smith. Make the motion with the set conditions. They include all the set conditions. Uh, I'm, I make a motion a to accept with uh, uh, all of the uh, additional things uh, that was brought forth uh, with the five percent rental. Yes. Sir. Just a motion and to approve with the, <coughs> the set conditions. conditions. Second second additional conditions. conditions. Okay. And is there a second? Second. second. Uh, motion is made with the established conditions, which includes the 5%. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Mr. Okay. I got one question. I, I, I did not hear anything about sidewalks. Is it in there? I can put sidewalks. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. It's, it's condition number um, five. Number five? Yep. Okay. Page nine. Num that's number nine. Okay, got it. Sidewalks number five and the A sale and D sale lanes are number nine. Okay, great. Any Thank other you. questions about council before we take a vote? Ms. Charles, did you have any other questions? Seeing none. I know, no I'm sorry, what did she say? She said no. No questions. Okay, seeing none. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. All opposed? That motion carries. Next item. The next item is approval of the use of the American let me put my glasses on, can't see that. <laughs> American Rescue Plan offer funds. Okay. Good evening, um, Mayor and Council. This item is pursuant to the detailed discussion that we had at our recent Mayor and Council retreat. We had the opportunity to go through our February focus plan, uh, refresh, rebrand, renew. And as you probably recall, a significant element of that was our opera plan allocation. Uh, it's included in your agenda packet. And again, we spoke at it in some significant detail at our recent retreat. Uh, this is the recommended methodology for GMA to cities receiving $10 million or less. Our allocation is 6.2 million. And so this puts us in line with the best opportunity to make best use of this funding uh, in the areas previously discussed. And with that, I'll pause if there are any questions, we'd be happy to address them. Members of Council, you have before you approve of the use of the city allocation of the American Rescue Plan Act, ARPA funds in the amount of $6,261,781 as revenue loss replacement that authorized the city administrator to execute a proposed project plan and have the authority to adjust projects and funding allocation based on need and funding availability. Is there a motion? Are you bringing so, it to the floor? I'm bringing a motion to, to, okay. to approve or disapprove. It's up to you. I, I, I have motion? questions. So, so what, do you, what are you what? doing? You just want to bring it to the floor? Yeah, Okay, please. is there a motion to bring an item to the floor? Mm -hmm. Is there a second? Second. Okay, the motion is now brought to the floor. Okay, thank you. May I ask my question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, yes. Um, I, I wanted to see what we have allocated for our citizens with this uh, ARPA uh, funding here. I know um, last year when we got the three million and so it was brought to council, um, I think the second time we had some amendments to it to make sure that a certain portion of these funds would be um, allocated some way to serve our citizens in reference to the um, pandemic and some of the negative things that has happened 
with them, to them. And I would like to see, I see utility assistance on here, but you, you, I'll, tell me what does that mean, utility assistance? So there is $550,000, which exceeds the amount in the previous ARPA plan to assist citizens. So there's $550,000 to your point, Councilwoman Davis, for utility assistance. This will provide an opportunity for all residents of Fairburn currently in arrears to be able to bring those bills current. That's a significant opportunity as we have a, uh, due to the pandemic and the impacts of the pandemic, a lot of our residents who are uh, notably quite a bit behind on their utility bills. So this will be an opportunity directly for residents to be able to access this funding to bring those accounts in arrears. In the previous plan, as it was presented to me, there was only about half a million dollars for resident assistance. So this exceeds the previous amount. Okay. Above that, what I would also tell you is that the local small business grant program are a lot of local business owners, and there there's another $350,000 allocated for that program as well. So that also will be able to help some of our local business owners in the downtown area who are also Fairburn residents and business owners as well. And so we think between the two of those, this is a more ample distribution directly to citizens and business owners than in the previous allocation. Okay. Um, how much um, the utility bills are in arrears? How much? I do not have the dollar amount. And Mr. Martin, I don't know if, if that's information that you would have available this evening. I can certainly follow up with you and let you know exactly how much is in arrears. It exceeds the amount that we've allocated. Oh, um, it does exceed the five. Yes, ma'am. And so this okay. would help to bring that into balance. Um, but we can certainly follow up after the meeting to give you a specific accounting of exactly how many customers are currently in arrears. Well, <clears throat> is there any way that we can add more money to this so we can take care of all the arrears? So again, I don't have the exact okay. number and I'd be happy to provide that. I think this allocation would bring us into balance on those utility bills. That was the intent of this allocation. Yeah. But I'd wanna reserve comment until we can get okay. that exact number for you. Okay. But that's how we developed this particular allocation is to help bring those accounts current and give every citizen who's in arrears an opportunity through this program to bring those accounts current. Okay, well, I would like to see that we take care of all the arrears. Certainly. It would it, it would seem to me, and, and I can get input from my colleagues, that that would be a great um, way to help our citizens who have fallen behind through this pandemic, which started in 2020, March of 2020, and we are here in 2022. Right. Um, you know what I'm saying? So to just be able to assist them, and I think that would be a great assistance. Um, for some of the use of, of the ARPA funding. And I commend you on the grant program for the local small businesses. I'm sure that will also help our citizens, um, help our businesses to hire people from our city um, and stuff like that. So I'm just, uh, I just wanna make sure we are taking care of our citizens in, in a way. That, and you know me, I'm people before build, buildings. <laughs> so so. <laughs> uh, I certainly uh, respect your perspective and agree that we have to certainly make sure we're focused on our citizens. Our roughly approximate uh, amount in arrears is about $850,000 currently. Now that number is, as you know, a rolling number. It changes month over month. Right, and right. so we're at about $850,000. This allocation would provide $550,000. We also are consistently working with our residents through payment plans and other options to help them become current. And so that's where the numbers currently stand. And again, that's a uh, rolling number that changes month over month. And is that working well with our citizens, that payment plan? Yes, the payment plan option is always available for citizens. This $550,000, I believe, would be uh, over and above that payment plan option and really give people a chance to catch up those accounts that are in arrears. And so this will be a direct opportunity where citizens can access that funding okay. and bring those accounts current. Okay. All right, I'd like to hear one of the colleagues. Uh, Mr. Whitmore, go ahead, sir. Oh, he had the floor okay. next. Uh, uh, well, yes. Uh, my colleague already tapped on it, but I just wanted to add uh, to that in the respect that there are some entities within Fulton Go County government that also 
still has the monies available for assistance. So even with the other 300,000 plus, mm -hmm. maybe we can still reach out or have them reach out uh, because they, there's certain criteria that they have to meet in order to get those funds. Mm -hmm. And as long as they provide the, the correct paperwork, that's available on top of what the city is doing, and that may help us reach our goal even, even quicker. Great suggestion. We'll certainly follow yeah. up on that, Councilman Rimmer. Okay. Uh, business. Uh, business. Uh, Go ahead, sir. Small business uh, portion of mm -hmm. uh, Could you speak to the criteria of it? Because um, I heard you say downtown. Is it just downtown? Also, maybe um, speak to the because we have business owners in Fairburn versus also just businesses in Fairburn. So, what's the criteria to meet? The, so, um, we are developing those criteria. Is it intended as a small business grant program? And so, it is to focus on small businesses. I would not at this point tell you it's exclusionary, but there is a focus on our downtown development through our LCI master plan to developing some of those empty spaces. We've looked at a number of different allocations in other jurisdictions. Um, it's often administered through third party vendors that help to administer the program. And so we're looking at those types of programs in similar cities. What I would tell you is with our focus on downtown, though it's not exclusionary, we certainly want to make sure that we can use this to jumpstart development right. in our downtown corridor. One of the applications that we've seen be very successful are what are called facade grants which allows businesses in the downtown corridor to get a distinct amount of money to help upgrade their facades and create a consistent look throughout downtown that is in our historic mode, but gives these businesses an opportunity to create a better facade appearance, and that helps to promote new businesses coming into downtown as well. So we're looking at those details now, but we will certainly look at best practice as it relates to downtown development, though it won't be exclusionary. Okay. Uh, Ms. Charles has a question. Uh, we have to get her back on the phone. <laughs> well, go, go ahead, Mr. Heath, and then yeah, I'll come, I'm going to come back to her. Go yes, ahead. I, I just have one question. Is it about the lifts station of improvements? Yes. What, what exactly does that entail? Mr. Martin? That entails the upgrade. We have, as you know, new subdivisions coming in. So the amount of sewage that we've had before for these lift stations, we've had an upgrade. And we're looking at pipe size, also security. We've had some breaches there. So we're looking at a full, complete makeover of those. Also some security lighting out there and bigger pumps. Because as you know, stated before, we've had problems with those pumps as well, being undersized. So that, that's what I was wondering about is uh, because I do know that in the last uh, few years that we've had to replace uh, the um, pumps themselves, it seems mm -hmm. like, and everything else. And so I, I was just wondering, are we still having problems with that? Well, but you said there's an increase in uh, waste uh, product and stuff like that. So I can, I can certainly understand that. Thank you. And that is also some of the consistent feedback we've gotten from citizens at, for the development we've approved is can our current infrastructure handle the nearly 1,300 homes that are already in the pipeline? And so this allocation is to make sure that we support that with our current infrastructure. What I would also tell you is that earlier in the year, Congress passed an omnibus infrastructure bill, which will provide some opportunities for us to more deeply fund those types of right. system improvements. Right. Our sewer system is a discussion we're going to have very soon because there's some significant uh, opportunities for growth and improvement in that area. Yeah. But this is to address the most immediate needs as we bring new developments online. Got it. Okay. Thank you, sir. Ms. Jones. Okay. Well, then I, I, the, the thing that I want to bring up um, in this case, we talked about the uh, utility director just uh, mentioned an area of uh, concern that I have as it relates to proper pipe size. Oh, now you are. But another area, and again, when we look at, and again, thank you, Mr. Uh, City Administrator, talked about the additional money we're going to try to acquire. Uh, as he and I set through the different allocations and the staff as it relates to what you see on paper, uh, again, uh, with $850,000 of outstanding over overdue payments and utility, uh, that's, that, that puts us, what, $300,000 short. The problem, the concern we got is, 
uh, the different areas that you see here listed, uh, itemized. Uh, neither one of them are actually uh, covered the area that's in need. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you a concern I got that most people will probably overlook. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys are watching the story. I want to say, and I want to make sure I don't use the wrong county. I believe it's Clayton County, where an entire sub uh, uh, two major buildings burnt down because fire hydrants mm -hmm. didn't work. And now these people are literally homeless yeah. mm -hmm. because, and so uh, as something, and one of the things that as we, as, as the city manager and the staff and I put a lot of this stuff together, one of the things we were looking at is what I call, pre, what is known as preventive maintenance. Uh, for many of you may remember two weeks uh, before my inauguration, uh, a police officer's mom's house burnt uh, as a result of a defective fire, uh, hydrant uh, mm -hmm. right there at Mary Erner. And mm -hmm. so, uh, this That's type of point. step, this type of step can't happen because right now I assume that that government is going to have a major lawsuit at some point as a result of uh, all those people being put out of, a, you know, being displaced as a result of a, a fire, you know, as a result of in this case none of the fire hydrants in the whole set of division work. I'm just, I'm mean, still in total yeah. disbelief. One of the uh, concerns I looked at is when we were looked at our, when we talked about the downtown, uh, as uh, you'll see, I have a meeting with the with the DDA. Uh, very soon to talk about uh, the guy, uh, talk to owners such as the, the people that you all have actually approved this year because one of the things that the people have talked about they want to see our downtown uh, they want to they want to see a jump they want to see our downtown get going in the next couple of years and they they uh, the business owners I've talked to told me that we're mayor we're realistic with you we understand but in two years we ought to be able to, we ought to be able to see something moving forward <laughs> and so that facade we talked to uh, our consultant, yeah. uh, Chris Pipe, that uh, yeah. helped us find the facade. You just heard him mention it. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, and as the city manager tells the daily, tells the staff, uh, uh, his favorite word is, we've got to get some wins. we got to get some wins in the column. <laughs> 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 and so, this, this uh, again, I say that jokingly, yeah. but in this case, uh, not to mention, uh, you, you've heard him mention an issue that's going to come up that we've got to address very soon, sewer capacity. Yeah. Uh, the discussion we've got to have with another government that we're negotiating with, and it's, unfortunately, it's going to be very expensive. Yeah. And so, wow. uh, and so, but we have to address this issue with sewer capacity. And so, some of the things that you see listed here yeah. actually is going to contribute to us not being hit so hard when it's all said and done. And so, I just yeah. thought, I just, yeah. members of council, I just wanted to make sure you understood that, as the staff probably don't say publicly, but there's a lot of information. And a lot of collaboration, uh, and let me let me let me say this too. And I just think it's in order. Uh, one of the things that I'm very happy about right now is that you see, regardless of whether it's Third Friday, whether it's the fire department put a new truck in in action, the collaboration now that goes into the city staff as it relates to running across police being any issue that deals with a request of uh, public safety, the chief of police, and it's a collaborative effort. And one of the things I'm very proud of, a lot of the information that you see now, i.e. The, the item we passed earlier today with, uh, for, you know, for uh, tax exemption, uh, this is coming as a result of a collaborative effort in every department talking to their colleagues. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's, that's big. That, that, may, that may not seem like a lot. No, and the reason why it's big, and I, and I won't get off point, is that as a result of the different men and women in, in our management staff, in our leadership staff, one of the things that I want to give you credit, uh, give the city manager, and I know it may, he, he's going to be like, man, I can't believe you're going deep like this. One of the things that I'm very proud of that we've done, the city manager has met with several departments below the management level. We found out some issues that we've got to address. You're going to hear about one of them later tonight. <laughs> that we've got to address that, uh, in this case, is going to help bring our city and make a whole. So I say all that again, like I said, the list we're looking at, I'm hoping we can find that extra money. Uh, for utility because every one of these areas right here have to be addressed uh, very soon. So again, I'm sorry for going off the deep end. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Whitmore, you had another question. Uh, uh, <clears throat> yes, Mayor. Actually, the question would be toward to our fire chief, but certainly coming through your office, sir. I just remember last year or when we were looking at the downtown area and we did have some fire hydrants that needed to be, the piping needed to be changed to lar larger diameter pipes. Was that done with all this? Um, actually, it goes back to the big fire we had. Uh, the downtown area is the main area where we have the smaller piping. And so any major fire in the downtown area would be where we would have the issues. So we still have to bypass that one hydrant to go to another one in order to make it? 
Well, since the big five, we they we did run one um, twenty some inch main down to the downtown area, so we can tap into one uh, big line yeah. uh, for fire protection. So, Mr. City Administrator, I'm just asking you to take a look at that because I, it was my understanding that while we're doing this construction out there, mm -hmm. that was being addressed. Yeah. Do you recall yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah. And and to hear that that yeah, wasn't absolutely. done is somewhat alarming. But here nor there, we it's something that we need to look at, especially as we continue to build up our downtown area. We want to make sure that when we have our fire response team that comes to a fire, we'll put it out a whole lot quicker than they have to run around finding a uh, uh, larger diameter pipe in order to pump the water through the way we need to. So we've got at least 18 of them getting ready to go in immediately. Um, but that is not the whole of the issue. And so we've recognized it, taking steps in the direction to begin addressing it. But to your point specifically about downtown, I'll get with Chief. We'll look at that area specifically to make sure we address that so that we can uh, make sure that box gets checked. But you will see something later on the agenda tonight to address fire hydrants. But again, that's not the entire problem. Right. It's a step in the right direction. Uh, also, this plan allows us, because these are estimated buckets that we're putting these allocations into, this plan allows us to move some funding for areas as we begin to drill down on specific projects and have some cost savings, then we can certainly reallocate to some of the areas like further utility assistance to make sure that we're providing absolutely as much help as we possibly can. Okay, thank you. Thanks, ma'am. And then there are no more questions. I need a motion to approve or disapprove. So move. A motion to, so approve. to approve. A motion to, to approve, approve by Ms. Davis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Heath. Any other comment by council? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. The next item. The next item is award of a bid for fire hydrant replacement project to Shockley Plumbing. Is there, oh, go ahead, sir, I'll let you speak. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Councilor. I think we've covered every item I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> Guess we can move on to a motion. <laughs> but uh, on the agenda tonight, the utility uh, department, specifically the water division, is seeking approval of the bid award recommendation for Shockley Plumber Incorporated to replace 18 of those fire hydrants that were identified by the fire department that needed upgrading. Yeah. The upgrading will remove the old two-way hydrants and pipeways and upgrade them to the eight-inch three-way LDHs, which is uh, large diameter hose connections. Integrated Science uh, Engineer assisted the city staff during competitive bidding process. The bid was closed on March the 31st, 2022, and on April the 4th, 2022, Chocolate Plumbing Incorporated was awarded the bid award recommendation as the lowest bidder. Now, the proposed uh, expenditures will come out of the American Rescue Fund. With this approval, the new fire hydrant will increase water pressure for fire emergencies uh, and allow a successful ISO, which is the Insurance Service Office rating. A fire department ISO rating is a determination by this entity on how well our fire department can serve the community. First, you assign the score between one and 10, with lower numbers indicating a better score. High ISO, high ISO scores can increase home insurance rates in the community. So I've given stride with this project is to reduce everything, improve those lines, and uh, not run across situations of those nature, especially in heavy dense areas. So at this time, staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the bid award recommendation for Shock, Shockley Plumbing Incorporated in the amount of $403,200 for the fire replacement, fire hydrant replacement project. Are there any questions at this time? Well, let me bring the item to the floor. Staff, uh, you, I mean, members of council, you have before you, staff recommends the mayor and council approve the bid award and the uh, recommendation for Shockley Plumbing Inc. in the amount of $403,200 for fire hydrant replacement project. Is there a motion? So to, moved. A motion to approve. Is, I need to approve. A motion to approve has been made by Mr. Heath. Is there second. a second? Second. Second by Ms. Davis. Any questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Jones has a comment. Good evening. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> she cannot go. Yes. 
Uh, yes, um, Mr. Martin. Yes, does that project include um, an evaluation of the uh, piping under those hydrants? Uh, do we know if uh, they've been upgraded in recent years? Uh, are they uh, large enough to carry water flow, the highest water flow possible uh, for uh, a hydrant? Yes, as a matter of fact, that was included in the contract was that when those smaller uh, fire hydrants are there, if the upgrade of water flow needs to be up to eight inches, which is regulation by the state, then we are to improve that at that point. And also, okay. mm -hmm. also not to keep turning water off for older fire hydrants because they don't have an isolation valve. We'd install an isolation valve, which means that if that fire hydrant gets broke, we can isolate and still keep flow to citizens' home without interrupting the water flow as much. Fantastic. Um, are there new technologies uh, relative to those hydrants, um, like um, an automatic shutoff valve? I don't know how new that is um, technologically, but, um, you know, because sometimes uh, we see water flowing um, unlimited down the street uh, because a fire hydrant has been knocked over or some issue. The new valves you're proposing, I mean, the new hydrants you're proposing, uh, they will not affect water flow to residents, but it does affect, um, affect excess water um, usage. And so is there, uh, are there any technological advances to assist with that? Yes, there is. These are what you will be considered as we install the breakaway fire hydrants, which means that they automatically, the minute they are struck, they'll break away from the uh, foundation through the bolts, but won't uh, undermine the thrust uh, factors at the bottom, where it's uh, thrust in and held into place. So that won't be any problem. So it'll break off at the top, plus most of the fire hydrants been lowered in the ground. Today's technology raises them up above so the when a vehicle or they're being struck, they immediately break off and then the uh, stub, as you would call it, is still stuck in the ground, so it's in a shut off position. Okay, that's great. Um, and I, I want to encourage um, you, um, Chief Robinson, uh, Mr. Phillips, to let us take advantage of the latest technological advances uh, relative uh, to this. I, I mean, that's what the, you know, those dollars were you made available to us for. And let's not, uh, let's take advantage of that. Then one last question I have for you. If you find um, a pipe that needs to be replaced because of water flow, what would be the length of those pipes? I mean, how far would you go? Say you have one that's, um, you know, 20 feet or so but then past the 20 feet, the piping is very narrow. Um, what, what's the decision or would be the decision relative to that? Well, I've talked with the contractors and we're, we have included that in there as a contingency to work with that up to a meeting up to another flow. In other words, we do have some that are two and a half inches throughout the city, which is not adequate enough water flow. We're gonna map those as well and improve as far depending on the distance of it and the cost go from there but if not and it's longer than we project we will enter in as a capital improvement project and move forward with it okay that that is fantastic um and i'm glad to know that that inventory uh, is planned because that is a question or some information that i had asked um, uh, of you via Mr. Phillips and uh, Ms. Chris a uh, um, month ago, so ago. Uh, we, we really do need to know what our piping inventory uh, is uh, and plan to uh, replace those as, of course, dollars are allowed, but most definitely to maximize those dollars uh, from the federal government uh, to eliminate as many of those as possible. So so thank you for bringing that forward. And thanks for the information. While we're having this with Tim, it's a similar to the conversation you just referenced. We're working with Integrated Science, mm -hmm. one of our partners as we work with our infrastructure 
to assess and camera all of our entire system so that we can identify exactly where we have those restricted piping areas and begin to plan through the omnibus infrastructure bill I mentioned earlier to apply for the funding to be able to address that on a systemic level. And so the first step is working with integrated science mm -hmm. to completely evaluate the entire system so we can identify exactly where we need to make those improvements because our understanding at this point is it is systemic. Um, a lot of the infrastructure in Fairburn is quite old um, and is smaller piping. And so we're gonna have to assess exactly where that exists and then utilize the opportunities in front of us to try to make those upgrades. But integrated science is partnering with us to evaluate and make those assessments currently. And if uh, that, that, that's fantastic. Uh, and I, I'm asking for that information because there are additional dollars available um, directly from uh, certain departments of the federal government, um, EPA, uh, and sub departments under them that references uh, um, infrastructure. And so I'd like uh, our city to take advantage of those dollars uh, as well. So the sooner we can identify that, have that inventory, and the more data that we can collect, uh, that puts us in a better position to go after some of those funds as well. And the last piece I would add to that is our GIS system, which is another key component in identifying these infrastructure needs, has to move forward. We've got some growth areas in our GIS system as well. So we're also working on that component of this simultaneously. And so you make an excellent point, Mayor Pro Tem. We're focused on that and trying to figure out how we fully assess those needs so that those opportunities you mentioned through other agencies and that omnibus infrastructure bill, we need to target specifically where we need to make those improvements. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, any other comment, Mr. Whitmore? One, one question, man. Uh, you mentioned GIS. Mm -hmm. Is that our MIS? Excuse me. We have that mapping system that we actually started some time back to identify some of these things. Is it MIS, GIS, or? It was, it was just GIS, and what it did was in the preliminary state of it was that it identified some, but after we looked over it, it started identifying things that were wrong, things that had been upgraded and hadn't kept up. So we need a whole new, a complete overview of each one. Okay. Now the future, the future way that we're using in the mayor's vision of technology is to go to the SCADA system and eventually do that as we're doing it. That technology you mentioned about Pro Temp Jones is that you put sensors on the fire hydrant and any loss of pressure, we're able to gauge it on a map on the screen and can immediately respond to those. Wow. So that is the future. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank Sounds you, great. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Next item. The next item is to establish human resources specialist position in the human resources department. Good evening. Yes, ma'am. How you doing? Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, all members of um, council, thank you all so much um, for allowing me the opportunity tonight. I stand before you tonight with the item requesting your approval to establish a human resources specialist position within the Department of Human Resources. Uh, we certainly believe that having a very healthy and a well group of employees uh, mean that we have an engaged group of employees. And currently right now, we don't have a dedicated personnel um, dedicated to the essential functions of benefits and wellness. Um, our department right now is transitioning as we are streamlining technology, our benefits initiatives, and employee engagement. And so this position will definitely be an integral part in making sure that we're meeting those needs. Okay. Uh, mem mem hold on one second. Right sure. To the floor. Oh, that's right. Members of council, <laughs> members of council, you have before you a uh, mayor council to establish a human resource specialist position for uh, current fiscal year 2022 budget year. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. The motion is to approve is, uh, by Ms. Davis. Is there a second? Second. second. Second by Mr. Smallwood. Any questions or comments? I have a question. Ms. Davis, go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is a new position? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so how many staff do you have in HR now? Currently. I've, I've lost touch with the floor. Is April still there? Sure. Currently, okay. we have myself. Um, I have internally kind of reclassified as it relates to just the classification of my two staff. 
We have one staff member, Crystal Starr, who's our human resources generalist. Her position is more focused on employee engagement, recruitment, employee relations, those um, essential functions of HR. April, who's our senior HR journalist, her position is more focused on processing city payroll, timekeeping, our um, HRIS system, things of those nature. Okay, all right, great, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about council? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, that motion carries. And next item. Next item is uh, hmm, low income home <laughs> energy assistance program agreement between the city of Fairburn and the Georgia Department of Human Services. Go ahead, sir. Mm -hmm. Mayor and Council, uh, the utilities department is, is seeking for Mayor and Council to approve the LAWAP which is the Low Income Household Water System Program, agreement between the uh, Georgia Department of Human Resources and the City of Faber to offer this federal program that helps low income households pay for drinking water and wastewater for their homes. This program will help pay home water bills if the water bill is in their name or can verify a water burden. The American Rescue Plan Act on March 11, 2021 appropriated an additional 500 million to the new LAWAP effort to provide emergency temporary relief to water and wastewater customers impacted by COVID. The question, what happens after this agreement is approved and signed? How households that apply with a rearage or past due amount water bill will be prioritized. Each household is available, uh, is eligible to apply and receive LAWAP assistance once per program year. The amount of system, the assistance is determined by household size, income, and composition. The WAP benefits will only be issued directly to the household's water supplier. Even though LAHEAP assists with the distribution, the benefits cannot be used for your energy bill. Beyond this point, all criteria and information will be posted on the website, social media, and all other outlets, also within those federal uh, entities that were acquired for our area. This agreement has no budget impact to the city. Staff recommends that the mayor and council approve the LAWAP uh, agreement between the Georgia Department of Human uh, Services and the city of Fairburn and to authorize the mayor to sign the agreement for the city of Fairburn. Members of council, you have it for you for mayor and council to approve the LAWAP agreement between the Georgia Department of Human Services and the city of Fairburn and to authorize the mayor to sign the agreement for the city of Fairburn. Is there a motion to approve? So, so moved. Second. Is, is the motion has been set, uh, made by Mr. Heath, second yes. by Ms. Davis. Is there any questions or comments by council? Ms. Jones, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, I see you in the queue. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the question um, for you, Mr. Martin, is how long uh, is that uh, program, will that program be in existence? Uh, it will be each program year. After talking with uh, the uh, people at the Department of Children's Services, right now, if we go ahead, sign it, and uh, get everybody in, majority of everybody can be approved no later than by July. Then the program hey. will start back up in October, and it'll go for another calendar year, back down to this time doing in for July. So time and- And who's, process, who's processing the applications? Uh, the children, uh, Department of Children's Services, LAHEAP, okay. LAHEAP will okay. aid in as well. All right, and um, I work, thank you for bringing that uh, forward, uh, a good program. I would also ask you to research um, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, HUD. Is that the same department you're, to you're referencing? Um, no. So we could certainly do some due diligence to see what opportunities are there as well. Okay, so yes, um, so through um, Department of Health and Human Service, Federal Department, they have a um, similar program uh, for water like the LAHI program, mm -hmm. and those are American Rescue dollars also. Uh, and so I asked uh, Mr. Phillips if uh, you and staff 
could uh, uh, research that project and see if you can leverage um, both of those projects to broaden you know, the support to residents um, regarding water. Okay, I, I will search into that. All right, thank you. Any other member council have a question or comment? Nope. Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. Now, thank you, Mayor and Council. A final item is a, an item that was added. Uh, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, mayors, <clears throat> all the mayors, uh, with the exception of the city of Atlanta, have agreed to, uh, uh, to adopt, excuse me, to adopt, to actually hire uh, Mr. Andrew, Andrew Welch as our uh, representative spokesman, in this case, legal representative and legal counsel to represent us, all the cities in the lo uh, local option sales tax negotiations. Uh, this is the same individual that actually represented all the cities uh, 10 years ago, who, and I can attest, because I was there, he did a phenomenal job. And so without any hesitation, every mayor agreed that we did not want to go in a different direction, and everyone agreed that they wanted this mayor. And so because we're not having another council meeting, it was imperative that we get this approved tonight. Uh, we, and again, uh, I apologize for the delay that you were not able to get this prior to today, but because of the required legal review by the city attorney before I could give it to you, uh, I received it after, after you had already received the council packet. So uh, you have, uh, at that point, this is the reason this is before you. So uh, members of council, you have before you a resolution appointing and authorizing special counsel to represent the city of Fairburn to negotiate a local office of sales tax distribution certificate as required under the laws of the state of Georgia to authorize said council to assist in the preparation, negotiation, mediation, or arbitration of the city's loss, repeal, incons inconsistent provisions, and for other purposes. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. A motion has been made by Ms. Davis. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Heath. Any questions or comments by council? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries. At this point, I will actually have council closing remarks. I'll start with Mayor Pro Tem. Um, no comments, Mayor, um, other than to say uh, thank you guys for all of your patience uh, and in common accommodating this uh, technological transfer. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Whitmore. Uh, no comments, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Heath. No comment. Ms. Davis. No comment. Mr. Smallwood. No comments. And Mr. Pat Powell. Why is she going to comment? <laughs> <laughs> I met a traveler from an antique land who said, uh, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, and near them in the sand, half sunk the shattered visage lies, whose wrinkled lips sneer and crown of cold command, tell well it's scoped to red, those passions which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things by the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, my name is also Mandias, king of kings, look on my work, she mighty and despair. Nothing besides remains, round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sands stretch far away. You know that you say common sense. Uh, with that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And I, I apologize, <laughs> you, you threw me over that. Uh, the, city the city administrator's report, I, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, but uh, go ahead, sir. Very briefly, just two brief updates that I wanted to provide, both for mayor and council and for our citizens as well. Uh, Duncan Park pool and splash pad is as popular as it has ever been. Wow. Um, and so we are facing some capacity challenges. Um, that's a good thing. The, that's a good thing. Um, the pool fills up typically within two hours of opening each day. Uh, our max capacity is 150 people. And as you know, the pool's not been full-time over for nearly two years. Uh, we've got one of the best water features around. And so naturally it's popular. And so that's created uh, what I would phrase as a good problem. Uh, though it's not a good problem if you're the one standing in line right. and you can't right. get in. Uh, so we know that we have some uh, operational issues to address there because we don't want our citizens to be frustrated trying to get there. I spoke with a neighbor of mine in my subdivision who stopped me uh, this weekend to tell me she couldn't get her grandbabies in the pool because it was crowded. And so uh, we've got to fix this so I can continue to live in my subject. Uh, but that said, we are working with Ms. Payne, our Parks and Recreation Director. We're looking at posting capacity notifications on our website and social media so citizens will know before they get ready to pack up and come to the pool 
whether or not it's already yeah. at capacity. We used to sell tickets in advance, pre-sale tickets. If you rented a pavilion, you could get pool tickets to go along with that. We're going to have to forego that for the foreseeable future because it's at capacity as soon as it opens. So we don't want to pre-sale someone a ticket and then when they show up, they're not able to get into the pool. Uh, we're also going to look at creating swim sessions on the weekends, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., a three-hour window there, and then 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. The purpose of that is currently, if you purchase a ticket to get it at 11 a.m., some people stay in the pool the entire day, which would mean that after about 11 or 12, we're pretty much done for the day. By doing it in two sessions, you purchase a three-hour ticket. We allow the pool to clear out, and that way the next group of citizens get a chance to come in. Yes. So we're looking at that That's as well. Good. And then some additional signage with weekday hours listed uh, that we'll put up immediately. The last part of that is probably the most comparable water facility in the area is Welcome All Park, which has an indoor natatorium, and that pool is closed for the summer mm -hmm. uh, to do some operations. So we're getting all of that flow as well. Uh, we were popular enough to begin with, but with that added into the mix, as you might imagine. So I wanted Mayor and Council, and importantly our citizens, to be aware that we have our finger on the pulse of that. We're doing everything we can to try to accommodate as many swimmers as safely as possible. So know that we're focused on it and trying to create some solutions. The second update, I'm gonna pause and allow Ms. Chris to uh, provide an update on our stage and courtyard. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Good Just good so you evening. know, the stage lettering at the Arnold, the Frankie May Arnold stage has been put up. In addition to the um, plaque that was weathered has also been replaced. Staff is currently in the process of working with the vendor to um, finalize pricing for the replacement plaque, for the dedication plaque of the stage letters, in addition to the lettering for the GMC dedication building and that plaque as well. And so we are prepared to provide you with an update at our July 11th meeting. Um, as far as it, when it comes to Duncan Park, Mayor Pro Tem, we are also getting pricing for that, those two plaques as well. Mm -hmm. As of right now, of course, the, these items are not currently budgeted. So we are identifying funding with the help of our finance director. So we will have a complete update for you at the July 11th meeting. Okay, great, great. great. And that concludes our updates. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And my final comments, I uh, just want to make sure we uh, remember this Friday, uh, the fire department has a yeah. push. I uh, want to make sure council, uh, you, got a, you should have gotten an email. Uh, that's going to be, a, that's a very traditional event that we would now want to implement. Very excited about that. Uh, also um, want to make sure that uh, I got, let me make sure I got the right. July the first, we're going to actually have a rally, a pet rally, uh, for at the courtyard for the Creekside High School, only the Fulton County School that was invited to DC, I believe, for the parade. And so, as as a result of our students, uh, ninety percent of our students being a being a tenant of that school, we're actually going to have a rally. Uh, and again, uh, we're excited uh, between the city of Manitou's and former. Uh, a band uh, with Trump Major, Trump Major and, yes, and our mayor. Moments by Tony Phillips and <laughs> Hattie Porter's Jones. Ooh. Ooh. I heard about you. Can't wait. Can't wait to and see as he, this. As he stole my thunder with Miss oh, yeah, yeah, Hattie, yeah. Hattie Porter Jones, a former uh, pep, pep stand up. Become great. Uh, right? I thought you told me you were one. Oh, oh, I can be one. Oh, <laughs> that's how we should have. Hey. Some, right we should now. have some great. <laughs> we should have some great representation. Yeah. Uh, both uh, the, between the students and adults uh, at that rally. So, with that being said, I'm gonna. Uh, we have I a help you. I session with all, all three categories. Yeah, litigation. Uh, can I entertain a motion Mayor. to go in the executive? Oh, hold on, hold on, one, one second. second. Third Friday on Main Street is this weekend at 6 p.m. Yeah. We invite everyone to come out. We are just really Thank looking you. forward to another great time. We had a wonderful time last yeah. month. Uh, staff has worked together collaboratively for this concert as well. Uh, this is our Juneteenth concert, and so please come out and support that ever. Bring your family, your kids. It's a family-friendly environment. It's a great opportunity for us to celebrate Fairwood and build a sense of community. And we just want to encourage all of our residents to come out and uh, take place, take part in our third Friday on Main Street event. And on that note, it, uh, just as a reminder, our city uh, is closed Monday. Yes, sir. In, 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 in our, in, in, in our uh, for a holiday of Juneteenth, I just want to make sure okay. we're aware yeah. that uh, our government will be closing up. And lastly, I would tell residents to come early. We've already had over 200 people to RSVP uh, on, uh, for the event on Friday. Really? And so Cause I had you to, to get your lawn chairs and we come out early. We get the reputation. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's all right. Ma'am, can I just say one thing? 
I think you, Mr. Oh, Whitmore, so too. Yeah. Well, no, actually, I passed it off. That's what oh. I was talking about. <laughs> so okay. I passed it One off. last update. We're a busy city. <laughs> On Saturday, the 18th, at the GMC parking lot, there will be a yard, yard sale. Yard. Yeah, and so we've right. got a number of participants already for our yard sale. For those of you who are yard sale aficionados, we encourage you to come out. There'll be some great <laughs> deals. On some unique items, and that'll take place on Saturday at the GMC parking lot. Wow. Yeah. yeah, quickly, I just want to give kudos to Chaffet Payne for what she has done with our parks and recreation. Yeah. Uh, just tremendous across the board. Stuff for seniors, for the young people, the middle school people. It's just activities going, and, and I mean actually very, very good activities going on. She has done a tremendous, it went from nothing to abundance. <laughs> well, I, I, Ms. Payne is a mm. huge asset. She's made the most of a really small but powerful team. She's got some great staff members there. Yeah. And so yeah. I will stop there because I am very proud of the staff we're building yeah. and the teamwork yeah. that we're now putting into collaborating together. We're gonna build the best staff anywhere around. I'm yeah. confident of that. And we've got some tremendous professionals on our staff, and so we're yes. looking forward to continuing to work together to create positive things for the city yes. of Fairfield. Awesome. You're doing a great job. With that being said, can I entertain a motion to go into executive session for litigation? So moved. Second. 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 Motion is made and second by Ms. Davis. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? That motion carries. <laughs> Can you turn the AC on for a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry? For what? Actually, I know. So, um, I am, I'm in a, Yes, I'm in a public place. So can you just call me on my phone? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave Zoom and you call me on my phone. All right, thank you. Uh-huh. Okay. All right. <laughs> 